Yeah. Like as a mess. <laughs> the way I, I figure it's pressure. Good, we're trying to, oh, are we going to start? Tell her okay, in about five minutes, we're going to start the, uh, the meeting of the Antiquities Advisory Board. Okay. Okay, come on now. Maybe I am not connected to the internet. I don't know. Okay, it's time to be, begin the meeting of the Antiquities Advisory Board. If everybody would take your seat, and I think you have, thank you. 
Uh, today's date is April the 3rd, 2024, and the time is 8.30 a.m. This meeting of the Antiquities Advisory Board has been properly posted with the Secretary of State's office according to the provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551, Texas Government Code. The members may discuss and or take action on any of the items listed in the agenda. I want to welcome everybody to our meeting uh, this morning. I am uh, Jim Berseth, Chair of the Antiquities Advisory Board and a THC Commissioner. Now I'd like to do the uh, roll call, and uh, starting at the far left of the uh, table up here, I'd like to ask the AAB members to state your name and your position on the board. Uh, Rick Lewis, uh, architect from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Todd Allman, archaeologist, uh, represents the Council of Texas Archaeologists. Rob Ward, historian, part of the Agency. I'm Douglas Lloyd from Austin, representing the Texas Archaeological Society. Norman Alston, architect, Dallas. Laurie Limbacher, Austin, commissioner. Also architect. Sorry. Lilia Garcia, THC commissioner, Raymondville. Thank you, members. We have all of our members present. That, that's wonderful. Uh, so we have a quorum and our meeting is open. And uh, I want to especially welcome our new member, uh, Eleanor Starter from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Welcome to the, uh, the board. Uh, we have lots of fun uh, in store for you uh, during future meetings. <laughs> okay, our first agenda item is uh, item two, uh, approval of Antiquities Advisory Board minutes for the meeting 115 from January the 31st, 2023. Um, members, any corrections or changes needed? Hearing none, uh, unless a member disagrees, I approve the minutes of the meeting from January the 31st, 2024. Thank you. 2024, I've okay, corrected that. 31st or the 30th? This says the 30th. It says the 30th? This says the 30th. Okay, let me restate that then. I approve the um, minutes of the Antiquities Advisory Board for uh, meeting 115, January the 30th, 2024. <coughs> it says okay. two things. It says two things on it? Well, this says the Okay. Well, we covered it. We got it both ways. Through <laughs> the 31st. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I approved it both ways, so we're, we're covered. <laughs> okay. Now we're on to uh, item three, a, uh, Antiquities Advisory Board uh, for the SAL nomination for the University Junior High School. Uh, and before we get into this, let me just talk real briefly. We have a new member and some other members that are fairly new. Uh, the purpose of the Antiquities Advisory Board, according to the Texas Administrative Code, is to function as a preliminary reviewer for the Commission and vote on final recommendations related to appropriate issues of concern and present those recommendations to the Commission. So today we will be looking at this uh, and, and making a decision if this uh, uh, University Junior High School building qualifies to be an SAL and, and then vote on that or if we decide that it isn't. Uh, you'll have noticed in the background information that there was some additional um, material provided about, uh, for institutions of higher education, additional criteria that need to be considered uh, during uh, making a, a building on land owned by the, the uh, institutions of higher education and SAL. Uh, those criteria come into play if and when this nomination gets to the commission. Those are directed to the commissioners to consider when they're making the final decision about making an SAL a formal uh, landmark. So I just wanted to provide that background. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Charles Sadnick, Sadnick, Director of the History Programs Division. Charles, it's all yours. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm actually going to ask uh, Gregory Smith, who's our National Register Coordinator and also processes the above ground <coughs> SAL applications to, uh, to present on this uh, building. Also, I want to know that Edwin Bautista, who is the applicant for uh, this nomination, is here today if you have any questions. Clicker. Just press down. Down. There we go. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm going to provide some, um, some background. Uh, 
brief overview of the building uh, under consideration, uh, especially for members of the audience who might not be familiar with this particular building. Um, it is uh, the university, originally it was the University Junior High, um, built in 1933, um, and it served a dual purpose of providing education for students within the city of Austin, and also served as a facility for um, new teachers and student teachers in the um, university of, uh, in the uh, university's uh, uh, school of education. And so I'll give you a quick overview of it. Um, it's situated on, on the southeast quadrant of the campus, um, very close to uh, the, uh, the uh, football stadium and other sports facilities. It has a modified U-shaped plan. Uh, this is a photo from early, um, right after it opened, circa 1934, a, show, a photo of the, of the um, western elevation. Um, you can see some of the cast stone details, these reliefs over the west uh, entrance. It, it was designed to uh, be compatible with other buildings on campus, and so you'll see familiar motifs and materials. Uh, and so we'll just take a quick walk around the building, the west elevation, south of the main entrance. Uh, this is the east courtyard uh, facing uh, northwest. Um, there's uh, the, uh, the application is uh, the, the source of the documentation is the National Register nomination, uh, which was approved in 2003, and it was prepared by a student at the UT School of Architecture Historic Preservation Program back when Jim Steely uh, was the National Register uh, Department uh, director, um, and he also taught at the University of, of Texas in the Historic Preservation Program. So this essentially started as a student project. Uh, and so these are the, um, the um, options for motions, um, and I'm on hand if you have any questions. Any questions, members? Oh, yes, Lori. Uh, hi, Greg. Thanks for your presentation. Could you talk briefly about the basis of the proposed designation? The the basis of the designation, the SA, the SAL. Um, well, um, the SAL was um, submitted by a member of the public um, who's concerned about the future of the building. It's been proposed for demolition by the university, and so uh, members of the public can step forward and nominate properties to, um, as SALs. Um, it, this building meets the first criteria uh, for designation in that it is listed in the National Register, which is a requirement for buildings and structures. And is there any, anything more? I, I think the National Register nomination was based on social history. The building was, that's a very good question, thank you. It was listed in the National Register under two criteria, the first being criteria A in the area of education uh, for its, its dual role. It was educating the students who attended this when it was a junior high and also the student teachers um, who used this as a, a learning facility for themselves um, as they were getting ready to become teachers. Um, and it's also listed under Criterion C in the area of architecture. And the design architect was George Dahl? Yeah, George Dahl was the architect. He was a campus architect um, in the late 20s through the early 30s, and then the university hired Paul Philippe Cray, uh, who was very much responsible for the design of some of the key, key buildings on campus and also um, that, the master plan right. that uh, gave a lot of the universities the character that we recognize in it today. Thank you. And Cray, if I read correctly, was an advisor on this building. He was he, the advisor. He was, yes. Um, he was the, I forget the actual term, but he was, he was the advising architect. Yeah. Do you, I'm interested to know, um, Dahl designed maybe two dozen buildings on the UT campus. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know the status of those, how many of them remain? How many, uh, 
quite, quite a few. I mean, they're, they're in the core of the 40 acres and, and surrounding it. So he was really prolific. I mean, Paul, Paul Cray is the name that people recognize, but George Dahl was the architect behind, actually, the design of the buildings. Right, and Dahl had an extensive career, and much of his work is in Dallas. You know, he has some significant Absolutely. things in Dallas yep. that our friend Norman is working on. <laughs> yep. Any other questions, members? Hearing none, thank you, Greg. All right, thank you. Uh, Charles, I think we have a resource witness now. Yes, uh, Edwin Bautista is here to talk about this nomination. Welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Antiquity Advisory Board. My name is Edwin Bautista, and I nominated University Junior High for State Antiquity Landmark designation. As a native Texan who proudly walked the halls of public schools in our state's flagship university campus, I stand before you today to advocate for the State Antiquity Landmark designation of University Junior High. This institution isn't just a building. It's where the tapestry of the local community's past is interwoven with threads of countless futures. The narrative within the 1967 book titled Golden Memories of University Junior High reflects the cultural bedrock and educational sanctity that this site represents. The memory book reveals a story of ambitious growth and communal achievement, with every chapter contributing to the audacious narrative of Texas education shared within a structure that was constructed amid the nation's Great Depression and yet designed to be ahead of its time. The coalition at SaveThePassForTheFuture.com, which I stand with, isn't just saving a building. We're safeguarding the legacy of Texas education for future generations. The, grass group, the grassroots group represents a wide array of voices, all united in the cause to preserve the irre, this irreplaceable cornerstone of our community. Before I conclude, I would like to leave you, the board, with a piece of the memory book which can be found just a few blocks away from University Junior High in the Dolph Briscoe Center of American History. Golden Memories of University Junior High graphically illustrate, quote, quote, Golden Memories of University Junior High graphically illustrate the best of the past dream. If these memories can kindle a desire in any ex-faculty member or student to resist the dilution of quality by the expansion of quantity, then this dream, which lived one brief 33-year moment was not in vain, end quote. I'm not here fighting to save a 90-year-old building. I'm here to preserve the spirit and memory of every life that it has shaped. University Junior High is more than brick and mortar. It is a living archive of our progress as a society, and I urge you to help us protect it for future Texans to cherish and learn, and learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Batista. Okay, we have a couple uh, motions uh, for the committee to consider. Uh, I'll read the two motions, and if we could move to that page as well. There we go. Uh, the first motion is uh, move that the Antiquities, Adv Antiquities Advisory Board send forward to the commission and recommend approval of state antiquities landmark nomination for the University Junior High School, Travis County. And the second motion is to, to deny the uh, or reject the uh, state antiquities landmark designation for the University Junior High School. Would a member like to move forward one of the motions? I'd be glad to do that, Mr. Chairman. I uh, move that the Antiquities Advisory Board send forward to the Commission and recommend approval of the state antiquities landmark nomination for University Junior High School. Travis County. Thank you, Norman. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. We'll open it up for discussion. Uh, members, do we uh, have discussion items we want to bring up? Lori, I, I think you might want to start. No? <laughs> can, I, can I say one thing? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, as a, uh, as, as an, a doll aficionado and a, an alumnus of the University of Texas, the uh, need for this nomination is clear to me, and I very much appreciate uh, members of the community coming forward and making a stand in, uh, uh, for, for preserving some of our really most important historic buildings. So thank you all very much. Um, I do have a question. Um, just to refresh my memory, and maybe for new members and uh, the public, by putting the SAL through, will that prevent any kind of demolition? 
it, um, it, it, what we're doing right now is a recommendation to the commission. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. So, so when, if, if we uh, approve this and send it to the commission, uh, the University of Texas has not opposed the nomination. If they oppose it, then uh, the, our, the, the, the Antiquities Code requires that we go into an administrative hearing with a hearing judge that will oversee the, uh, the nomination using the ad advanced criteria that I mentioned earlier uh, to consider for the commission to make the final decision if it should become an SAL or not. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a much more complex process. And I'm not sure we've ever actually gone through the administrative hearing process, but that's what will be required. So, uh, so what we're doing today is just our educated recommendation to the commission. Uh, things could get a lot more complex for the commission mm -hmm. down the road, and, and probably will, would be my guess. <laughs> but Mr. Chair, it's my understanding, and it may be incorrect, that um, the SAL designation would add some additional scrutiny and review and processing, but it is still possible to demolish an SAL. Okay. It, it is, it is. But it, 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 it oftentimes is used as a reason to prevent demolition of a building. And um, there are provisions. I, I spent many years working for my city at, on a municipal um, uh, landmark designation commission. And um, from that I know you can't save every building. And so in that situation, there are uh, requests, requirements to thoroughly document a building, mm -hmm. which I think is included in the, the requirements under the SAO designation process. Thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions? Hearing none, let's call for a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm gonna oppose. One opposed. Motion carries. Thank you, members. and. Um, uh, commissioners, get ready. <laughs> okay, now next we have agenda item four. Uh, we're going to do our division uh, reports. The first one is uh, uh, Brad Jones, the director of the archaeology division. Brad, it's all yours. Good morning, AAB members. Thank you, Chairman Brusseff. All right, just do our uh, standard uh, quarterly reporting. Um, you'll see before you the number of Texas Antiquities Code permits we issued in the past quarter, and I would like to point out that's not for the full quarter. It's only till March 25th when uh, I had to turn in my slides. Um, what I'd like to point out is there was a significant jump in permits over last year, um, 54, which is um, a pretty, I was surprised. Well, I wasn't surprised because I signed them, and I've been very busy for the past quarter. <laughs> But I was surprised to see the, the uh, year over year uh, jump and it just reflects again the continuing development um, of the state and the amount of work we are seeing uh, both um, as reviewers for state level as well as federal level work out there. Um, and this is just a breakdown of the uh, types of permits we issued. Again, you know, no surprise here, intensive survey, which is going out and looking to see if there are cultural resources in a project area ahead of construction is the most common and uh, most common permit here. And you can see there are actually more intensive survey permits issued in the past quarter than there were in permits entirely last year during this quarter. Um, also a number of uh, data recovery, testing, um, and other projects. And I just want to take an opportunity, um, our newest reviewer, oops, dang it, uh, Mary Jo Galindo did have an opportunity to go out and do a site visit at one of these data recovery projects. This is a TxDOT project down in Starr County. Um, the principal investigator is Chris Ringstaff up here, who last time you saw him was wandering around in a boot, but is now wielding a shovel. Um, and the reason this project went to data recovery is that in South Texas, um, there have not been a, a large number of archaeological sites which have a lot of good archaeological stratigraphy, so separation between different deposits, which allows you to look at you know, more nuanced changes over time in a region. So um, this site does have that, so it has a number of well-stratified components. So um, that was the uh, justification and reason for excavating this site, because it does provide a very rare opportunity for us to look at uh, prehistoric cultures in that far South Texas area. Um, and unless there's any questions, that actually ends my portion of this report. Thank you, Brad. Next, we'll hear a brief report from Elizabeth. 
about the architecture division? Yes, good morning. I'm Elizabeth Brummett, uh, director of the architecture division. Um, thank you for being here this morning. Um, for the historic buildings and structures permits over the last quarter, uh, we saw relatively few. Uh, we issued six permits. In uh, the core areas that most of our work falls within, preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration. Uh, a handful of you have asked me to provide more example projects as part of this presentation, and so I, I did want to bring one forward to you this morning. Um, this is a recently completed permit, uh, permit number 1198. Um, this is the Leyland Museum, which is a Carnegie Library in Cleburne, Johnson County. Uh, it's both a state antiquities landmark and a recorded Texas historic landmark. The museum applied for um, an SAL permit in 2022 to clean the brick masonry on the west elevation. Um, and that's the, uh, the work that was recently completed. The scope included using a non-ionic pH neutral detergent, hand scrubbing with a synthetic or natural bristle brush, and low pressure washing of the brick. It also included uh, removing weathered mortar joints and repointing with a type N mortar. Uh, as well as filling holes and cracks within the brick units themselves with a comparable uh, lime-based grout that's a matching color to the brick. The completed permit was one phase in an ongoing project to rehabilitate the masonry of the building. The first phase was completed in the summer of 2022. Uh, this application represents the second phase of work uh, for the west elevation. Um, staff also recently in this past quarter issued a permit for work to the south elevation, which is underway. So that leaves the main elevation of the building as the, the final elevation to be completed. And the owner has submitted a Texas Preservation Trust Fund grant application that includes that work um, for consideration in fiscal year 2025. Um, so that is all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions for Elizabeth? No, uh, thank you. I was wondering what the Carnegie Library project was, so thanks for showing that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. Okay, now we're going to take a eight-minute recess and wait till nine o'clock when we can convene jointly with the uh, Texas Historical Commission. Time, so.
I'd say a small person said I said I never heard it. Really? That's what I feel now. The problem is there's a serious problem that is the criminal county. Okay. Hey. Good to see you. You're the person we need to talk to about what we. Okay, it is uh, nine o'clock. If uh, if everyone could have your have your seats, we're going to continue our meeting of the Antiquities Advisory Board. How do I get into these politics at the local level? <laughs> so again, okay, uh, members of the AAB, uh, we're now going to. Uh, uh, convened the uh, Texas Historical Commission for a joint meeting with the Antiquities Advisory Board. And at this time, I'll turn the microphone over to THC Vice Chair McKnight. Thank you, Jim. Um, good morning. Uh, to avoid any disruptions, everybody's requested to turn your phones on silent. Uh, public comments will be taken later. At a later point, I have them in front of me. Uh, so today is April 3rd, it's 9.01. Uh, the meeting of the Texas Historical Commission has been properly posted with the Secretary of State's office according to the provisions of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. The committee may discuss and or take action on any of the items listed on the agenda. Uh, can you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Commissioners, for the record, please state your name and city of residence, and we'll start with Lori and come around. Thank you. Uh, Laurie Limbacher, Austin. Jim Brissett, Austin. Lilia Garcia, Raymondville. Fritz Duda, Dallas. Donna Bohorich, Houston. Pete Peterson, Alpine. Garrett Donnelly, Midland. John Crane, Dallas. Tom Perini, Buffalo Gap. David Gravel, Highland Park. I, I just signed up for the previous uh, uh, testimony I gave. I didn't have any additional one, but I'm happy just to let the next person in line. Thank you.
Good morning. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a pleasure here to be here today to um, thank you for, at this point in time, uh, support of our nomination of University Junior High, Junior High at the University of Texas. Um, a couple of points uh, I'd like to add, and I'm with a coalition uh, that Edwin mentioned earlier uh, called Save the Past for the Future. Um, individuals from the community who are um, eagerly trying to support this historic uh, treasure on the University of Texas campus. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, the architecture uh, issue with, uh, with the building is that it is a significant representation uh, from the portfolio of, uh, of Dahl and uh, of Cret, uh, and um, was uh, designed and built at the same time as Memorial Museum uh, and um, the tower and so forth. Uh, it is a, a stunning, beautiful structure, uh, a Spanish revival structure that um, we feel um, uh, is uh, very additive uh, to the architectural portfolio at the University of Texas. Um, additionally, and I'll have other, another colleague or two that will add further, but um, the building, as you heard, was a collaboration between uh, Austin Public Schools and the University of Texas, very unique in the day, in the 1930s. Um, Austin needed uh, additional resources to meet the needs of the growing population, and the University of Texas needed a place to train uh, uh, new teachers. And so for over 30 years, that was done. UT College of Education became um, a, um, a seen as a, a state-of-the-art um, experience and opportunity for a training of educators. They were researching and trying out methodologies uh, within the building that were not happening around the country. In fact, in the early 1950s, there was closed circuit television from the classrooms uh, at University Junior High back to the College of Education uh, as a part of the work that they were doing with research. Several dissertations have been completed, were completed during that time around the research that was done. But beyond that, um, after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, University Junior High became the first successfully integrated public school in the city of Austin. And as many of you know, in, uh, integration was not successfully completed till the 80s here in Austin. But that campus um, was um, very successful in that effort largely probably due to the innovations and the things that were happening with the College of Education on that campus. Um, and so, so Kathy, many- one, just one minute. Uh -huh. So many you. individuals have, have um, graduated from that program. Additionally, the building um, holds a masterpiece mural, one of a kind art piece, uh, three uh, story masterpiece up the grand staircase by the renowned muralist Raul Valdez. Uh, and so that's another piece of our concern. I thank you so much for your support. We hope that um, our nomination can move forward in, uh, in, uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, next, Richard Armenta. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, my name is Richard Armenta and I bring to you a letter with the consent of um, Preservation Austin to read to you. Uh, the letter is very short, so uh, I'll get right to it. The letter is written to the president of the University of Texas, President Hartzell. Preservation Austin exists to empower Austinites to shape more inclusive, resilient, and meaningful community culture through this preservation. We write today to express our concern about the possibility of losing the Steve Hicks School of Social Work building for a new practice facility for football. Formerly home to the historically significant University Junior High, the building is an extremely valuable asset that tells a district and a hopeful story, a distinct, excuse me, that tells a distinct and hopeful story of Austin's racial past and we believe must be preserved. Our concern for the future of this building is in alignment with our underrepresented heritage. Um, which seeks to tell the full story of Austin's diverse history and advocate for saving and interpreting the sites that tell and reflect that history. We join the grassroots efforts growing around this building's preservation in imploring the university to preserve University Junior High and take leadership as stewards of its own history. 
Listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2001, University Junior High was established in 1933 as a collaboration effort between the University of Texas at Austin and the Austin Public School System. The laboratory school served a dual purpose, benefiting the university as a facility for future teachers to test new methodologies, as well as accommodating Austin's growing school-age population. Most importantly, in 1957, University Junior High became the first racially integrated public school in Austin following the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. University Junior High modeled the success of integration and paved the way for the eventual demise of Austin's segregated school system. In addition to this important historic association, the building is also home to the work of celebrated Austin muralist Raul Valdez. His piece, Heart and Soul, was commissioned by the School of Social Work in the mid-1990s. Depicting his artistic vision for the school's mission and repair of social justice. The demolition of this building would represent an absolute loss of UT's history. This, inclusive, this includes the history of the designers, craftsmen, laborers who shaped this monumental building and the histories of the countless children and students who learned here and applied the knowledge to build a better Austin and the powerful history of desegregation that transpired within its walls. We strongly believe that the university should take pride in the stewardship of these legacies and consider deeply what the loss of this building would represent. The University of Texas at Austin has amazing resources dedicated to its athletic programs and we, connect, and we recognize the priority that they enjoy on the campus. We call on the university to grant similar priority to its historical legacy. Preservation Austin is happy to serve the university as a resource on this and all other campus preservation issues. To set up a meeting to discuss this further, please reach out to policy and outreach planner, Megan King. Sincerely, Melissa Barry, President, Preservation Austin. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Richard. Barbara Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. It's a, uh, with great pleasure I, that I am able to attend the meeting today. I am also part of the coalition Save the Past for the Future. And I taught in the building known as University Junior High for 25 years. I want to underscore a couple of points that Edwin and Kathy and Richard have made today. The race history of this building is complicated. And it's the reason our coalition calls itself Save the Past for the Future is because of the necessity to understand and honor the past, even its dark sides, as we form a stronger society. The school was segregated in 33 when it opened and remained so for many years. But because of the prescience, I think, of the university's commitment to education, University Junior High was able to lead integration efforts. Austin uh, did organize a couple of students to integrate high schools right around the same time. But what is unique about University Junior High is because of its location at that bridge or barrier between West and East Austin, we were able to attract a large population of African-American students who went there voluntarily and willfully. Um, all the records we read about this history is that it was a very harmonious process of integration. There were enough students of brown and black heritage along with the white students that a student council, cheerleaders, sports, all of these areas became a rich source. I don't know many people who celebrate their junior high years, uh, but 
we have talked to innumerable graduates of this school who hold it in great pride. Ironically, in 1967, when the school closed, uh, Barbara, it, one, one minute. it also Thank happened you. to be the year that the University of Texas won urban renewal funds. They said they were going to expand research facilities to the east of Waller Creek. If you go to the campus today, you'll see that the area that they destroyed is now home to athletic facilities. Um, 350 families and businesses were displaced by the university in 67. So a significant part of the population of the school was also lost. I also want to mention the amazing tree canopy that surrounds the school uh, with uh, heritage trees of 60 inches and more. There's talk of moving them, but we have a hard time imagining with the drought conditions in Austin that these trees can survive. Thank you all for your deep consideration. Thank you so much. Okay, Holly, uh, how do you say your last name? Fornicate. Fornicate, okay. I would have gotten it wrong, so. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'm used to it. I know you're talking about me. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I'm Holly Fornicate. I have worked with the Texas um, tourism industry for more than 17 years and have volunteered on the Texas Forest Trail region for almost 10 years. As you all know, in 1997, the state legislature tasked the Texas Historical Commission with creating a statewide heritage tourism program, which resulted in the creation of the award-winning Texas Her Heritage Trail regions we all know today. Day-to-day -to -day operations of these 10 trails have been overseen by 10 executive directors. These executive directors cover the full gambit of responsibilities, including everything from supporting the cities within their region, marketing heritage tourism within the state, economic development, supporting the staff at the THC, and in some cases, they even act as janitors and housekeepers in their office buildings. I have never worked with a more passionate group of people. However, even though the workload has steadily increased over the, over the years, the budget has remained stagnant, um, <clears throat> with only a couple of minor budget increases making its way to the individual trail regions. This is making it increasingly more difficult to maintain the same level of service and effectiveness of the program. Increased funding would enable the executive directors to implement innovative strategies, update technologies, and enhance services to better meet evolving community needs. Furthermore, fair compensation for the directors is crucial in attracting and retaining top talent in the industry, ensuring continuity and expertise within the program. This year, we will be asking for more funding for the individual trail regions through the LAR process. To give you a little idea of the impact of this program and these directors have in the state, just the Texas Forest Trail region has accounted for roughly $3.7 billion spent by visitors to the state and almost 34,000 jobs. The Texas Forest Trail's social media channels had more than 17 million um, impressions just last year. That is the equivalent to filling 200 NFL football stadiums to capacity. And that's just one region. So think of how big our impact could have been with a larger operating budget. Ultimately, an increase in state funding is not only a prudent investment in the program's sustainability and impact, but also a commitment to supporting the dedicated professionals driving the success of the program. We will be sending out packets with more information and would greatly appreciate your support as we endeavor to secure additional funding. Your collaboration in advocating for increased resources would significantly bolster our efforts to enhance and impact the reach of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. So I have Tara and Sandy. Yes. Okay. 
Um, good morning, ladies. Good morning. Um, three minutes. Thank you. Good Thank morning, you. commissioners. Uh, my name is Tara Putnad. I currently serve as the executive director of the Brownsville Historical Association, and I am now um, the chair of the Texas Tropical Trail Board. With me today are several board members sitting here behind me. Uh, Craig Griffin from Rockport Fulton, he's our latest, our newest member. Penny Pellack from Agua Dulce, Gabe Ozuna from Donna and Past Preservation Scholar, and Valerie Bates of Port Isabel. This board has contributed over 620 volunteer hours so far this fiscal year. Good morning, I'm Sandy Jumper. I'm the executive director for the Texas Tropical Trail Region, and I'd like to report a few happenings since the January THC meeting. Our board secretary, Penny Pelak, and myself, along with Fulton Mansion staff and the Friends of Fulton Mansion, were present at the Fulton Mansion Historic Site to welcome the delegation of THC to Rockport and um, as they were attending the state historic sites in our area. Uh, a little bit of an update on our partner events. In February, we visited Valverdius. In March, we held our event in the city of Premont, which is one of our new members. We're also looking forward to our upcoming partner events. Our next event will be held in South Padre Island, sponsored by Visit South Padre, who we have welcomed back into our organization. In May, our event is going to be in the city of Edinburgh. We hold partner events each month, and we welcome you to attend each and every one. The Tropical Trail is also very involved in the Museum on Main Street project. We have been working diligently with the Texas Heritage Trail Program, the City of Rockport, and the Tropical Trail Region participants to ensure that it's, it's a successful event. And this is going to be held January the 25th through March 4th, 2025, and we hope you will all visit our region. And we're excited to announce that we will be having a Vista Experience workshop next week with the Texas Heritage Trail team in Rockport. And I just want to say uh, this is not in my report, but I echo what Holly said. So our membership trends due to implementing a new structure have seen a 24.1% increase from our 2023 numbers. Um, I'd also like to mention that Tropical Trails is a proud sponsor of Real Places this year. We look, uh, please look for our virtual booth on the app and plan to attend Texas Heritage Trails <laughs> unveiling the Lone Star State's Timeless Treasures, where uh, Sandy will be one of the presenters on Friday. Uh, we're excited about that. And we've also left you all a goodie bag featuring our latest Tropical Trail flag. And we hope that you are proud to display this banner uh, as proud as we are to represent the, the THC in all our endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's cute. Pamela Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, um, commissioners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pamela Anderson. I reside in Round Rock, Texas, and as an executive director of the Texas Brazos Trail Region, I'm honored to have the opportunity to share some exciting updates and uh, of events um, from our uh, from our dynamic region. So in recent months, our region has been bustling with activity, highlighted with Navasota's Texas Birthday Bash in early March, celebrating our state's rich history. Looking ahead, we're anticipating the highly awaited solar eclipse over Texas with many events throughout our region um, to celebrate that and welcoming um, guests and visitors and travelers from all over the world. This event is uh, draw, uh, drawing travelers from all over the world to communities uh, to our region, including Gatesville, Colleen, Harker Heights, Temple, Waco, and beyond. We're thrilled about the year-long heritage celebrations marking Waco's 175th and Rockdale's 150th anniversaries, as well as the upcoming Georgetown Red Poppy Festival, Brian's Festa Italiana, Caldwell's Czech Kalachi Festival, Salado's Scottish Gathering and Highland Games, and Clifton's Norwegian Country Christmas Tour. These events are vital for our local and regional economies. And at the Brazos Trail Region, we actively support, collaborate, and promote them to maximize their positive impact 
and our partner, um, uh, with our partner communities. Our board chair is led by um, Joy Samar Smith. Joy is associate director of the Dr. Pepper Museum located in Waco, Texas. She brings a wealth of experience and passion for heritage preservation to our organization, as well as all of our board members. Uh, Sharon Whitaker is also here. I believe Joy might be in the audience as well. Um, our board's dedication to our mission has been invaluable and the leadership that they provide for our region will continue to guide us even, great, uh, to even greater uh, towards success in the future. At the Texas Brazos Trail Region, we cherish our partnerships with communities across our 18-county region committed to celebrating and preserving their unique culture and heritage. Our mission is to unveil the abundance of hidden gems within communities along the Brazos Trail region, encouraging visitors to explore the vibrant tapestry of history that characterizes our communities. We want to express our gratitude to the Texas Historical Commission for their ongoing support and collaboration. Together, we are preserving and celebrating the diverse heritage of our great state for generations to come. We look forward to our continued partnership in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Okay, Valerie Bates. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Vice Chair and Commissioners. For some of us, this is about the most valuable three minutes um, each quarter. So thank you so much for allowing us to speak. My name is Valerie Bates. I'm the Marketing Director for the City of Port Isabel, and I manage the Port Isabel Lighthouse State Historic Site. With me today are Cody Camacho, who works with me at the Lighthouse and the Port Isabel Historical Museum, and City Manager Jared Hockamo, who's no doubt stuck in traffic. It's been a busy quarter at the Lighthouse with a 22% in traffic over 2023, which had an increase of 16% over 2022. We had 8,000 visitors and event attendees at the Lighthouse in March. There were some factors that gave March 2024 an edge, like better weather than last year and having Easter fall in March. But January through March are up 10% and year-to-date up 9.7%. Cody and I worked the fifth annual Lighthouse Easter Egg Hunt on Saturday, Easter Egg and History Hunt. We've been inspired and encouraged to bring an educational component to this popular mm -hmm. event, so we did. We had a thousand Texas Historical Commission red custom imprinted eggs containing instructions to a history hunt, and they were scattered with the 25,000 other eggs in Lighthouse Park. 380 hunters completed the first step of the hunt and 121 completed the entire hunt. It, enthusiastic participants came from all age groups. The lighthouse had a line out the front door. Well, there's only the one door. And the keeper's <laughs> cottage was inundated. We were delighted. The program doesn't expire until the end of the month, so we expect those numbers to go up. On Monday, we will host a solar eclipse viewing event at the lighthouse for one of three state sites, historic sites that do so. Our promise? You'll be 75 feet closer to the solar eclipse while you are two and a half miles from South Padre Island. Uh, we are nearly sold out. We know we're not in an ideal position, but um, uh, well, people love the beach. And we're honored to have a delegation, we were honored to have a delegation from Austin, including Joseph Bell and Commissioner Lilia Garcia, thank you so much, from Raymondville for a visit in February. The site visit is an opportunity to share our lighthouse experience with people who care the most. The visit also received notable media coverage. We're also making progress on our classroom project. Preliminary design conversations are uncovering a wide variety of exciting opportunities that will allow us to offer an even better visitor experience. On the Texas Heritage Trails program front, I have submitted a letter of support for an increase in funding at the regional level to match the increase in responsibilities. I appreciate your deep consideration for this and support for this award-winning program. The trails bind the agency's outreach together on the visitor level in a way that no other agency program can. I'll close by adding that the City of Port Isabel is a proud sponsor of Real Places 2024 for the second year. Well, last year was 2023. And we've left a goodie bag for, for all of you. If you get down there by the 30th of the month, please participate in our history hunt. 
And um, also inside your bag is uh, a copy of the state official state map. And um, we're on the back cover advertising along with Texas Tropical Trail. Thank you so much for your time, Vice Chair. Thank you, Valerie. Tammy Verdon. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tammy Verdon, the Executive Director of the Texas Forge Trail Region. On behalf of the Texas Forge Trail Region, we just want to say thank you to the commissioners and to the chairman for your support, your continued support in all that we do. And thank you, Chairman Now, Texas Forge Trail has uh, kicked off the year running. We have handed out over 2,000 brochures in January and February to travel shows as McAllen and Brownsville and the Fort Worth Home and Garden Show. We just completed our first of four mini caravans that we will be doing this year. We uh, did it a couple of weeks ago. Kickoff was in Abilene, Texas, and we had 12 attendees, but we had a lot of followers um, on social media and virtually, and we are um, looking forward to the next one that will be in June. That is the 5th and 6th, and we will be starting in Jacksboro, and we will go through Jacksboro, Graham, Mineral Wells, Possum Kingdom down to Throckmorton and spend two days in that part of the region. And then September will be our third one, and then we will finalize um, our caravans in December. The uh, around the same time, December 5th and 6th, we will do it in con uh, around the San Angelo um, Christmas at Old Fort Concho. So we will end up in San Angelo at Fort Concho during their Christmas event and end the day with shopping and um, living history and lots of great information to be had that, that day as well. We will do our first wine festival of 2024 uh, next weekend, April 13th at Fort Belknap. That is in Newcastle outside of Graham. That is in conjunction with the Graham Chamber of Commerce, Crawfish and Cannons. The last three years, it's been a sold out show. We've had 3,000 of our clo closest friends there and we look forward to doing that again this year. We will have a fall wine festival in Mason County this year um, in conjunction with the Old Yeller Days. So we um, have been very busy, uh, also working steadily with the full region as partners in the museum on Main Street. And uh, we will have that the latter part of March, early part of April of 2025 in Buffalo Gap. And we are looking so forward to that. Our regional partners have been very engaged and um, very willing to help any way that they can. And there'll be lots of activities going on over those six weeks. As we continue- um, So Tammy, one minute. Moving okay, forward. We um, are planning on multiple programs, um, increase in caravans. We are looking at continuing a caravan um, each year, um, no longer doing the mini caravan. We'll go back to a full caravan, looking at a two and a half day event each year in conjunction with a board retreat, bring our board members along and they will invite a person to go along with us. But again, thank you. Thank you so much. So that concludes our public comment, and the commission will now meet concurrently with the Antiquities Advisory Board. So I will turn it to Commissioner Brissett. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, McKnight. Uh, we're going to resume our, our, our jo joint meetings, and we're going to work. I'm going to be working off the agenda for the uh, Historical Commission. So we're going on to uh, agenda item 3.1, presentations. And the first presentation is going to be an update on the city of San Antonio and U University of Texas at San Antonio project. And Lori Houston, assistant city manager for San Antonio, I believe will start us off. <clears throat> Welcome to the meeting, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Houston. I'm an assistant city manager with the city of San Antonio. You have all seen me here several times. Um, usually I come to talk to you about the Alamo. And today I'm here to talk to you about Hemisphere and what's going on in the Hemisphere Historic District 
And then I'm going to pass it on to Karina Green, who's with UTSA, Vice President of Real Estate Development, and she'll give you an update on the Institute of Text and Cultures um, initiatives as it relates to the potential relocation. So with regards to Hemisphere, we've been working on Hemisphere Park since 2012. It is a historic district. It is a series of three parks surrounded by retail and housing development. The three parks include Yanaguana Garden, that is a children's park, and it opened in 2015. An interesting fact about this park is the majority of the children and the families that go here are from San Antonio. It has not become overwhelmed by tourists, which a lot of areas in our downtown have. Um, you also have the Civic Park. Phase one opened in 2023, and it was just in time to host our Jazz Alive Fest. And if you've seen the pictures, that lawn was filled with lawn chairs and dogs and families. And we've had several large events since then, including our Dia de los Muertos events, several music festivals, and this will be one of the locations that we will celebrate the 2025 Final Four, the men's Final Four. They're coming here in April of 2025, and they will all play in the Alamo Dome, but we're planning on using the entire Hemisphere Park footprint to host the Fan Fest and their music festival. And then the last park that has yet to be designed is the Tower Park, and that is the park that surrounds the Tower of Americas. Yeah, thank you. So just briefly, when I mentioned Yanaguana, it did open in 2015. We've been able to meet the desire to have that surrounded by retail and housing. So we have Doe Pizzeria, Commonwealth Coffee, both are very, they're local favorites in the San Antonio community. Coonster Tap and Brat House, Paletteria. This is a young man that started selling um, um, paletas out of his little cart as a high school student, and now he has his own store. He can sell easily 3,000 a day on a hot day, just traveling through the park and in that location. Um, Bombay Bicycle Club, our Jerk Shack, Cush Fair, Box Street All Day Restaurant, Lick Honest Ice Cream, and Rerooted Urban Winery. All of these are local um, restaurants, and they are thriving. If you go there, during the day, maybe on a Saturday or Sunday, and it's a nice warm day, you'll see people outside, you'll see children playing, and you'll see this area in action. And then Hemisphere 68, that is a housing project. Um, it's a little bit over 200 units. It's 97% occupied, and it's been open since 2019, um, and it stayed pretty um, full during COVID as well. Um, but great project, um, quality design, very compatible with the park. The next um, development is the Civic Park development. So we have the Civic Park. That project is about a $75 million park improvement. You'll see that in the middle. And as I mentioned, phase one is open. Phase two is under construction. But we have really two developments. Um, you'll see them among three parcels, A, B, and C. Parcels A and B, about 50,000 square feet of retail. There's going to be 350 market rate apartment units and um, 800 space parking garage that will be shared with the users of the park because that's one of the challenges within the park. And then our 200 room Hilton Courier Hotel that has broken ground. It is limited to 200 rooms because when we had our community workshops about Hemisphere, one of the things we heard from the community is no more hotel rooms. We want Hemisphere to be for the community. So there is a deed restriction on this property related to hotel rooms specific to the property that the city owns. And then the last park I want to talk about is Tower Park. Um, this park will surround um, the Tower of Americas. Um, we expect it to be about $20 million of improvements. It will activate the historic homes surrounding the Tower of Americas. Those will be much like the ones you see around Yanaguana, local restaurants. Um, neighborhood serving retail. And then you'll notice on the bottom, you can see that round figure. That is the John Woods Courthouse. And next to it, that little kind of curved rectangular um, space, that is the Spears Training Center. The city acquired that through a swap. 
um, in the, around 2014, 2015, when we traded this property for some property we owned over on Cesar Chavez, so the federal courthouse could build a new a courthouse on Cesar Chavez, and then we purchased and swapped our property with them, and we actually closed on this in 2022, 20, I think it was 2022. We did have a great experience with THC when we closed on this. Um, we went through the Section 106 process, identified what areas of the property needed to be preserved, and we are committed to that, of course. Um, this will be um, a great opportunity to preserve a history of time, a part of time when this was a courthouse, but it was also built for hemisphere. So are we, you know, it's gonna be fun to interpret this as an amenity for hemisphere, but then it became a courthouse in 1970, and how do you tell both stories? And in the middle of that is a beautiful plaza, um, Plaza de Mexico, that we will be um, um, definitely activating. We've been using it quite a bit already for some activations. Now next to that, you see three rectangular buildings, and it's really a parking lot, a federal building, and then another parking lot. Those are currently owned by the General Service Administration. Um, we are having conversations with them because the city would like to acquire that property as well. Um, we'd like to acquire that to just expand the vision of Hemisphere, which is to be a community gathering space, a place where people meet, surrounded by um, multifamily opportunities and retail opportunities. Um, which leads me to the, the next property I want to talk about. And before I turn it over to Karina Green, I do want to briefly talk about um, the THC site. So this is a, oh, I can't travel with this. I'm going to try to move in the middle and I'll scream. So hopefully you can hear my voice. Then I don't get to go to the screen. Um, it'll be easier, I'm sorry. Um, some due diligence to see about expanding our convention center. Um, we probably need to go about up uh, about 200,000 square feet to be competitive with everyone in Texas. And as you know, the city of Austin, they're doing a convention center ex expansion. Dallas will be doing a convention center expansion. But one of the things we found out in co during COVID is people changed how they like to meet. And so we need some more meeting rooms. We need some more exhibit space that's contiguous, so um, a large conference um, can take up, you know, as much as, um, you know, 400,000 square feet of exhibit space, um, and, and that's something that's very valuable for our conferences. And then, of course, another ballroom um, would be helpful as well. Um, we are going to be paying this through our hotel occupancy tax, um, and then you have the Alamo Dome. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you've been to the Alamo Dome. Um, if you haven't, you're not missing out right now. Um, it is a 30-year-old facility. It is in need of some love and care. Um, it continues to be loved by the Final Four, but in recent um, times, um, specifically we applied for the Men's Final Four for 2031. They turned us down saying that your Alamo Dome needs some improvements. Basically, they said it nicer saying they're looking at other and newer facilities which meant, okay, if we want to continue to be a place for Final Four, which is a huge economic impact for San Antonio, um, we need to do some improvements. And so we are planning on expanding our hotel, our, our convention center, improving the Alamo Dome, and then you can see those parking lots in there that are a little bit east, um, sorry, west of the ITC. Those are all planned for our public-private partnership developments. That could be the housing, the retail, and when we planned the whole master plan for Hemisphere, the relocation or the potential for ITC to relocate was not on the table. Um, now that we've been working with them and they're doing their due diligence, if that's a possibility, the city is interested in acquiring that property um, for the purpose of expanding our vision for Hemisphere. Um, but there's a lot that needs to be done um, between now and then. I do want to also mention that the city of San Antonio applied for a, a federal transportation grant um, to 
it was a reconnecting communities grant to build a land bridge that connects downtown San Antonio back to the east side. This is something that several cities are doing, including Austin. You've seen this done in Dallas with Clyde Warren. Um, but it's a way to reconnect areas that were divided when the interstate system went in. And so we received a planning grant for about $4 million. We are going to be reviewing some alternatives of how we connect um, the hemisphere area to the near east side. Um, we would like it to be more of a cap, similar to what Austin is doing. Um, we're not looking at doing the big dig. We don't want to be disruptive. We want to do something um, that provides an opportunity to connect both areas, provides public space that can be activated um, all the time. Um, and this is just a great opportunity, and we were thrilled to be able to get this grant. Um, I'm going to pass it on over to Karina Green, who's going to talk more about what they're doing at the ITC. But I do want to stress that this is all within the Hemisphere District. We do follow the, um, the state guidelines. Um, we work closely with the THC, and we're welcome to provide regular updates. And I would encourage that just as it comes to this space, um, and I'm happy to come as often as you'll have me. So thank you. Thank you, Lori, and welcome, Karina. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to come back and uh, give you an update. We were here in October to tell you about the conclusion of our evaluation phase. And uh, we've moved into a due diligence phase, taking all of that information and really looking at the future of the ITC. So just to remind everyone, we gave an update on the uh, the process that we've been going through over the past three years. As you know, in 2021, we began a community discussion. Uh, we put together groups of task forces and a steering committee to really look at what the future of the ITC Museum could be. Uh, through that process, we put together a opportunity for the community to give feedback, both um, through public meetings and through our online portal. We did receive 600 comments uh, through that uh, portal to help steer the, the steering committee to the three scenarios that we were investigating, uh, which is to relocate outside of the Hemisphere District, to relocate from the Texas Pavilion, or to remain in the Texas Pavilion. When I came in October, those words are really small up there, I apologize. Uh, but when I came in October, uh, we did give the, the evaluation uh, report uh, indicating uh, that when we started to look at all three of those scenarios, we wanted to be very thoughtful, so we engaged a, a lot of different experts. We have spent a lot of time uh, in evaluation on the Texas Pavilion itself. And uh, we did conclude that to bring the Texas Pavilion up to accreditation standards, as well as to uh, just take care of the backlog of uh, systems that we anticipate will fail would cost around 177 million with no opportunity to repurpose the property uh, for financial benefit towards the new museum. Uh, the other spectrum, uh, which is the scenario that we've decided to take and further develop, is to relocate completely outside of the Hemisphere District to build a new purpose-built building that's about 65,000 square feet, would be around $103 million, and it allows us the opportunity to monetize the property where the Texas Pavilion is today to offset that cost. So as you look in an operational annual gap, a lot of museums do have gaps. We are looking at ways to close that when we relocate and we're able to monetize the land. We're at around a two to two and a half million dollar gap anticipated, whereas in the Texas Pavilion, we would have to uh, do a loan for the entire 70, 177 million, which would create about an $11 million gap. <clears throat> Again, the key findings from that report on the Texas Pavilion specifically uh, is that we do have a deferred maintenance backlog of about $7 million. We have invested money into trying to keep up with the deferred maintenance, uh, but right now our operational budget is over $3 million, including $1.4 million that we spend on just operating and maintaining critical maintenance items in a facility, and we get about a $1 million from legislation every year. So as we start to think about what is the future of this museum, we really want to make sure that we're, we're preserving uh, the artifacts, all of the uh, exhibits that are in there that indicate all of the, the rich culture of Texas traditions, 
And we do tie this intentionally to our academic mission, which is to promote uh, the opportunities to access research, education, and discovery. And so as we look at trying to tie that to our mission and to, to preserve that history, we just don't see a way to advance that mission in its current building. So as we think about what that museum might look like, we will begin a process of engaging with the community to really think about how do we honor uh, the building that it came from, its first home in the Texas Pavilion, as we look at reimagining in a more modern facility what we could bring. We want to have the dome show as something. We want to drive home digital experiences, more interactive experiences, and really draw upon the history of its first home. We have looked at two sites as we think about relocating. The first site that we're evaluating is uh, the Crockett Hotel site, the parking lot that is just to the east of the Crockett Hotel. We have entered into an MOU with 1859 Historic Hotels, which is the owner of that hotel, the Crockett and the Menger. We are about through that due diligence period with them. It is set to expire at the end of April. We're still in conversations with them through this whole process, we have been overlaying with the Alamo and with the General Land Office on what their needs may be. We do know that we would have to accommodate a parking structure that would uh, have parking for the Alamo, for the ITC, and for the two hotels. And so as we look at that, we wanted to make sure that we could fit the program as well as the parking structure for all of those uses within the Alamo view shed, and we have concluded that we can do that. As an alternate location, we have begun to study our Southwest campus. A lot of you may be aware that uh, in 2022, the, U the university was able to acquire the historic property and the Southwest School and merge our academic programs with our College in of Liberal and Fine Arts. And uh, we are using that property. The historic property is across the street uh, where it says UTSA Southwest Campus. That is the historic property. We do not intend to touch or modify the historic property. The uh, site that we're evaluating is across the street, which was slated for redevelopment when we purchased it. Um, there's a lot of uh, great benefit to studying this site as well. We are in the midst of a cultural district there. We have the Tobin Center, Hopscotch, and of course our expansion as we continue to bring our art programs into the urban core. With all of that, we have made the decision to close the museum at the end of May. Uh, we, we came to this decision because um, the building is in disrepair. Uh, when I talked about uh, the deferred maintenance earlier, we do have a, an HVAC system that is no longer functional. So for the past six months, we have been using temporary chillers to maintain the temperature and humidity in the structure. We do have mold growing on some of the exhibits at this time. We are in the process of cleaning that. And before we get into the hot summer months, we do want the opportunity to be able to relocate everything out of the Texas Pavilion. For safekeeping, we will move it into a, a new warehouse that will be uh, outfitted with all of the modern museum standards for humidity and temperature control. And we are looking to create a temporary space, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Frost Tower. For those of you familiar with San Antonio and what the university is doing, we have begun uh, an intentional expansion into the urban core. We have our campuses at down, uh, our downtown campus built in the 90s, our De La Rosa campus, which is where our new uh, School of Data Science is, and then the Southwest campus up to the north, and of course our Hemisphere campus. And so the Frost Tower is kind of situated right there in the middle of the city, and they have a, a vacant space on their ground level adjacent to San Pedro Creek, and that is where we would like to have a temporary museum. So as we work through the next five years and we look at uh, designing and what site we're going to build the new museum on, we do want to create a curated experience where we can really test pilot all of the digital experiences, work with the community, get that feedback. It is only going to be about 8,500 square feet, so we will have rotating exhibits and we will have to take the, the uh, museum into the community and really curate what that experience feels like. Again, we will be focused on digital experiences and um, really testing what that feels like. As we look at all of this, we do want to find a way in which we can honor the legacy of the Texas Pavilion, its architects, and we are working with the city of San Antonio on ways to think about could we use um, 
the Women's Pavilion, which is a vacant structure that was part of the original World's Fair. To honor this legacy, we, we may put an exhibit in the new museum, wherever that becomes located. So we are fully committed to honoring the history of the Texas Pavilion, and we are beginning a fully, interact sorry, fully interactive digital experience that will uh, go in and archive the Texas Pavilion. <clears throat> Next steps, as I said, Today we will be submitting a UTSA press release that will talk about our intent to close the museum at the end of May. We will be submitting a request for um, consultation with our intent to demolish the Texas Pavilion. Um, we will close the museum uh, this summer, begin relocation. We will look to begin an RFQ RFP process at some point this fall and then move into demolition by spring or summer of next year. Again, we are fully committed to honoring um, the ITC Museum and really being able to, to showcase in a new facility uh, everything that uh, the Texas, sorry, the ITC brings to the community. Questions? Yeah. Um Commissioners and AAB members, any questions for Karina or Lori? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to know, I've done research at the Institute of Texan Cultures before, so in the temporary iteration, will the collection still be available and the archivist will be able to help people locate? Yes, absolutely. So the warehouse that we're looking at does have um, an office facility, so all of our staff will be with the archives, and we will still have it open for research. Perfect. Thank you. It's really an invaluable resource for it really uh, building is. histories, and so thank you for keeping that open. Thank you, Karina, for your presentation. Oh, we have another question here. Yeah. Of course. Um, <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question. I'm, uh, I haven't paid close attention to this facility over the years. The, uh, the Texas Pavilion, how long has that been under the uh, stewardship of UTSA? Since the early 70s. Okay. And what, what is the, you, you've quoted a couple of times at least $1.8 million in deferred maintenance. What's, why? Well, why is that typical for buildings across the Sure. UTSA? So, yeah, so over the years, as uh, we became starts, we, we were allocated funding from legislation to help with the operations, both the, the staffing, the programming, and actually maintaining and operating the facility. It is almost 200,000 square feet. And over the years, we uh, have seen a decline in the financial support that we get from legislation. So since 2012, we have only been receiving a million dollars annually. And every year that a building sits there and we have been subsidizing that deferred maintenance backlog, those are items that are not critical to replace at the moment, but we know they need to be replaced. And so that continues to, to build. Uh, as we don't have funding to put towards it because every year our critical maintenance becomes more expensive. And so right now we're at about $1.4 million just in the air conditioning, the, the cleaning, the, the landscaping, the air conditioning, all of that stuff, and then going in and replacing things as they are failing. Okay, well, I'm, boy, do I ever know about deferred maintenance? I got about a quarter of a billion dollars worth to deal with. <laughs> but that's consistent across the entire campus. It is, is, again, is that... Is that a, is it consistent across your campus, or has this building been singled out somehow? No, that is consistent across our campus, and we are working right now on ways in which, so I, over, I oversee facilities as well, and we know that we have about $125 million worth of defer, deferred maintenance across our 6 million square feet. Um, a lot of our core buildings are 50 years old, so this is not our only building that is 50 years old, and so we are working on ways in which we can um, go to legislation and request funding there. Um, we are working on ways in which we can do performance contracts to go in and take care of upgrading some of those systems and replacing the systems before they fail, but it is not individual to this building. Uh, we do have a, a large backlog of deferred maintenance. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, uh, I want to thank you, Karina, for your thank presentation. Thank you so much, appreciate your time. Absolutely. We'll take a 10-minute break. We will come back at 10:10. Um, 10, 10.
In two minutes, we're going to reconvene the uh, our meetings. I'm doing great. Good, good, good presentations. Okay, it's time to uh, reconvene and, and, and restart our, our meetings. If everyone could uh, take your seats, that'd be great. <clears throat> okay, we are uh, back in uh, session after our break. And uh, we are on uh, presentations, but before we go to our next presentation, uh, I'd like to ask our, uh, our chair, uh, John Now, to offer a few comments on the first presentation we heard about the uh, uh, activities and the plans for San Antonio. Uh, thank you, Jim, and to uh, everyone, especially the commission and Jim, your group, I've been involved in a lot of this and wanted to provide a perspective on not just the building but the contents. Uh, as foot traffic in San Antonio will dramatically shift with an opening of a good visitor center, a redone Alamo and everything around it. That's where the foot traffic is going to be in San Antonio. It is not going to be out on Chavez Avenue where the building is. So there's the issue of the structure and the issue of the contents. I met with the ladies and talked about the importance of the exhibits and how they need to be where the people are going to be, from tourists to students. I think uh, that I met with uh, a couple of days ago with the 
a commissioner who's going to have a clear role in uh, the land commissioner, she's going to have a clear role in how that footprint's going to be impacted. I wanted to make a comment that, A, the inside of the building is not healthy. I don't know if you all have been in there recently, but for those of us that have any sensitivity to allergies, it is a bad experience. The good experience is the material. So I have, I'm speaking to say the, the contents need to be in a new structure in the range, the area of the Alamo to maximize foot traffic. The building itself then serves almost no purpose because the center of traffic is not going to be out where it sits. It's going to be downtown and to the Alamo. You may not know, but I, am, I have a business in San Antonio and pay a lot of attention to what's going on there, from tourism to foot traffic. And it, it has really impacted me that this exhibit needs to get closer to what's going to be the new visitor center if we're going to educate anybody on the contents and I think it's worth it. The building on the other hand is, uh, it's a real detriment. So that's, Jim, I thank you for the opportunity. That's what I wanted to have to say as, as chairman, the lawyer told me I couldn't be a witness. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, John, for those comments. We're going to continue on with our uh, presentations, and the next presentation is an update on the Alamo plan with uh, Kate Rogers. And Kate, thank you for being here, and we always look forward to your informative updates. Thank you so much, Chairman Brusseth, Chairman Now, commissioners, members of the AAB. We're always glad to be here with you to talk about what's happening on the grounds of the Alamo, and as you know, there's a lot going on right now. So we have three topics to cover with you this morning. The first will be an update from Patrick Gallagher on the progress for the new Visitor Center and Museum that Chairman Now was just alluding to. Today we're gonna to focus on the interior spaces, so you'll get an idea of what's planned um, for the exhibitry inside the space. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with the church in Long Barrack. You all approved uh, the, the emergency drainage project that's underway at the Long Barrack. There's been a tremendous amount of archeology span going on. There's also some emergency repairs that are needed to the west facade of the church that you'll hear about. And then finally, uh, you also approved a permit for the investigation into the historic cenotaph. Uh, the results of that uh, investigation are back and we'll talk about the path forward for restoring the monument to its original um, intent back in the 1940s. So with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick Gallagher. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners and THC staff. And before I start, I would like to um, thank the THC staff for all their support over the last few years in getting this project to where it is today. And I'm really thrilled to share with you the contents of the museum today. So it's, it's an update on where we are with the work in regards to the exhibition program and how this building will come to life as a new museum and visitor center. We've had countless um, meetings within the community and within our own team that includes over 18 historians, each with very specialized focus on parts of the story, very particular focuses on moments in history that keep us not only accurate in our storytelling, but as authentic and true to the 300-year history as we possibly can be. At times, it, it, I'm sure you can imagine, gets quite detailed and quite focused, and decision-making has to be very carefully considered for the impact on understanding for the visitors, not only just of the history, but the context of the people that were involved in that story. What you're looking at here is an aerial view of the new lobby in the museum, and as we had promised, the lobby will always be free to the visitors and that come to the Alamo. The, Museum itself on the upper floors will be ticketed, but this lobby space, which does have interpretation, we have a series of 
bronze vignettes that are full-scale sculptures that represent the major periods of time that we're exploring within the context of the museum, and they will also be connected to a digital application that will allow you to understand more about each of those periods that we're going to be exploring in the museum. Major ticketing and, and RFID registration, each of the visitors will have an opportunity to engage with additional content through an RFID badge that they'll, they'll will be um, part of the ticketed experience in the museum. Off to the upper right, you'll see the Civil Rights Gallery. The Civil Rights Gallery is also free to our visitors. It's our commitment in this historic Woolworth building to tell the history of the civil rights movement in San Antonio and the significance of that location has been borne out through historic research. We know that that's where the lunch counter was. We see the footprint in the floor and we will be doing a, <clears throat> a full recreation of that lunch counter. This is a long view down the lobby. You can see the character of the architecture is impacted by the historic Crockett Block building. All that limestone is original to the Crockett Block, so we'll be capturing that as part of the character of the architecture. And then off to the left, just a, a representation of where all the vignettes, the bronze vignettes, will be going. These are some shots from a, a photo shoot that took place in San Antonio a number of weeks ago by our team of artists that will be sculpting all of these figures in, in a studio in New York. They did almost a week in a studio setting the positions with the curatorial team and the education team to be sure that the, not only the costumes but the, the look and the character of the individuals would be appropriate to the period and to the character of the interpretation at that time. This is a view into the Civil Rights Exhibition. The Civil Rights Exhibition, again, is in the historic Woolworth Building and representing that very important period of the Civil Rights Movement and the Lunch Counter Movement in San Antonio. You can see the lunch counter will be fully represented. The space will be represented as well in the period of time that this, uh, not only that the lunch counter was here, but the lunch counter movement took place in this building. The lunch counter itself is actually a full interactive surface, so the visitors will be able to engage in content and activities on the surface of the lunch counter, and then all the supportive material and interpretation surrounding that. This museum space itself will have its own access off the street and off the main lobby, so it will operate and function as an important support to the ongoing history of the civil rights movement in San Antonio. This is a view of a mock-up and a rendering for the new 4D theater. The 4D theater is, a, is also a separately ticketed event here at the Alamo, and it's part of our revenue opportunities for enhancing the guest experience at the Museum and Visitor Center. This is a multi-layered screen experience. The screen is 114 feet wide and 28 feet wide and curves to an internal depth of 41 feet as a wraparound screen. So the visitors will actually be sitting in a dynamic wraparound screen to give a full three-dimensional character to the story. You can see here on one of these panoramic views, those little heads in the foreground are all the seating bowl that'll be part of a articulated seating bowl. Every seat will be an articulated seat that responds to sound and motion. There will be atmospherics in the theater as well that will provide smoke and a cloud scene as we move through some of the larger landscapes and into the battle. And the battle itself will be an incredibly dramatic moment as part of this 3D theater experience. Here's the full sweep view, the 150 14-foot span of what a panorama will look like in there. This is a multi-layered screen, so the multi-layers are what will give the three-dimensional character to the screen. Moving upstairs into the first galleries, the, we start with the indigenous people and move through. This is in the Crockett Block building. As you know, we move from the Crockett Block into the Woolworth through a connected bridge that goes over the lobby space itself. These are the major heartbeats of the story, starting with the Yagaguana into the indigenous life in the area. We will be looking at the indigenous peoples 
throughout time up to 1700. So this will go back thousands of years to the first settlers in this area because the indigenous people had an impact on not only the location, but on the evolution of the community. So from indigenous life, we go into a changing world, the founding of the mission, the next major heartbeat in the evolution of this site, and then life at the mission, and then the end of the mission era, which wraps up this gallery and this part of the floor. A view into one of the larger diorama spaces. This is a full-scale diorama. The background imagery is actually digital, so you'll see the indigenous life move through the time of day and the character of the environment, so that whole background screen will be part of an animation and interpretation. We have a number of interactives here. This one really gets into understanding all the different indigenous voices and indigenous languages that were spoken here on this site. So visitors will be able to engage not only through how they communicate with the interactives, but the interactives being able to communicate back to them. In the fund, founding of the mission, you could see in that surround space a major interactive, the well, which was the center of the mission at that period of time. So we are using that as an opportunity to do a dynamic interactive in there. And you can also see in the surrounding exhibits, we will be displaying the rich collections that the Alamo now has. They've been acquiring incredible new collections. And along with the collections that, that were part of the collection center, we now have an incredibly rich opportunity to really enhance interpretation with collections. Life at the Mission, as you can see through the collections that are surrounding, the storytelling is both driven by the environment and driven by how we use collections and how we use interactives. Each visitor responds to different characters of space and different characters of interaction, so we want to balance that everywhere we can within the context of the exhibition. Gallery four, we move into the Mexican War of Independence, Mexican Texas, the outbreak of revolution, and, but starting at the top, we start in San Antonio at the turn of the century. So that really begins the evolution of the growth of San Antonio, another key artifact that starts us off in that journey. And then as visitors move through the space, we have, we divide our opportunities with the architecture interpretation by balancing both the character of the spaces and storytelling, as well as, again, interactives and collections. So here in Mexican Texas, off to the left, are a series of dynamic full-scale interactive screens. The stories here are really going to be told through the stories of individuals. The historians have been working incredibly hard in helping us find a number of the untold stories. You all know many of the characters that are part of the history of the Alamo. Our goal is really to tell the full texture of what the community was like. So personal storytelling becomes a way for us to get visitors to have a much more focused understanding of what life was like here at the Alamo and at the Mission. Off to the right again, you'll see the extensive use of the collections, both two and three dimensional. We have an incredible collection of documents that will help support the evolution of storytelling here. From there, they'll move across the bridge and into Gallery 5, which is approaching the Alamo and inside the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo, understanding the battle and after the battle. This is our largest gallery. It's both large in its footprint, but also in its three-dimensional scale. It's a two-level height gallery so that we can really tell the story of the impact of the battle in a much more dynamic space. As visitors move in, using the character, again, of the architecture, both surrounding and above, to really take the visitors into the darker part of this story, which is the battle. And we use the, both the surrounding elements as well as the overhead with theatrical lighting and interpretation to help characterize that space. This is a storyboard for the battle theater itself. It's a full surround theater, so when the visitors are in this space, the entire environment will be a projected environment, so they will be in the battle, 
The three-dimensional elements in the middle are also projection surfaces, so the character of moving into that space and right into the battle will come to life for our visitors, and they will really have an understanding of both the chaos and the drama of the battle itself. Coming out of that, they'll go into the gallery that has one of our major artifacts that's currently on display, and that's the, the diorama that's in the collections building will be relocated and rehoused in this gallery that really goes into the evolution of understanding the battle. How do we take that apart, understand the moment-to-moment -moment events, who were the characters and who were the players involved in that, as well as the supporting artifacts that were actually there at the battle. And then after the battle really looks at that next step in the Texas Revolution. So we take visitors from the battle itself into the ongoing story of the Texas Revolution. That moves them into gallery six and seven, and that is the Alamo in the Republic of Texas, the Quartermaster's Depot, which explores the next generation lives of the Long Barracks, the transformation of San Antonio, the birth of modern San Antonio, and preservation story, and then the Shrine of Texas. This is a view into the Quartermaster's Depot. The many, many lives at the Alamo as a, both a piece of architecture and an important site, its evolution through time had many, many different opportunities for not only how it was used, but how it impacted the community and who lived and worked there. So here we'll look at through the Quartermaster's Depot, the evolution during the period of the Army, and then the idea of preserving the Alamo, the Driscoll story here becomes an important part of the turning point in the history of the Alamo in preserving it and saving it for its significance in history and its significance to the state. We've got some incredible collections from the Driscoll family that will help support that off to the upper right. And then looking at the Shrine of Texas, that, that sense of the definition of the Texas as a state and the idea of how we memorialize and remember not only this site, but the definition of Texas independence and the Texas Revolution. Our last gallery is moving the visitors again across the bridge and back into the Crockett Block. And this really looks at the story of the Alamo and popular culture. Popular culture was an important part of how many people remember the Alamo, how it was part of their history, and it not only through film and, and through music, but through the incredible collections that people purchased over the periods of time that they visited the Alamo. That will all be in here. We'll be looking at the site as an important memorial site and the site of gathering. And then our last space is an interactive space where visitors will be able to leave their uh, thoughts and memories. Here you see off to the left, is a large interactive screen that'll have all the films and all of the different television shows that the Alamo was part of, all that music. I know you're all going through your head thinking of all the music that you remember from these movies. That will be on as well as part of the environment. As the Lieutenant Governor said at the gala, I think he almost broke into song. His, his memories of the Alamo were part of this popular cultural movement. And then again to the right are three-dimensional collections, which are the way people's popular culture through souvenirs are a memory of the Alamo. And then the legacy of the Alamo, both to San Antonio and Texas, is an important part of that memory and an important part of the pride of Texans. And we think, and, and not only an emotional way for people to leave this experience, but an important way for them to really re-remember and respect why we're doing this here and why this is such an important site. The sense of memory and how people memorialize a site is an important part of what, not just what they mem remember through popular culture, but what they remember through the significance of who they are as Texans. So this is a, a capstone to the overall museum but the final step for the visitors is a place where they interactively can leave their memories. So they'll be able to engage in leaving their story as part of the Alamo history, and they become a part of history. So it's, we know today that all visitors 
have an opportunity to have a voice and want to have a voice, so we're giving them a place where they'll be able to express those memories here. So we're in the final phases of de design development. Believe it or not, we are going to be looking at fabricators and contractors to build this museum. Uh, some of the media is already in development. The 40 theater is well into production. And we're excited because the building is just about to break open and into full construction. And this project's going to happen. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah, any questions for Patrick? And uh, uh, let, let me start off with uh, Patrick. Thank you for that excellent presentation. And I really uh, appreciate the, the, the telling of all the stories in a rich fashion. I mean, that, that's really important for the people of San Antonio and the visitors that come to the Alamo. So uh, appreciate you doing that. And let me open it up more generally to questions or comments by AAB members or commissioners. Um, I did have one comment. Um, I echo what uh, Commissioner Jim Brusseth has just said. Um, thank you. That covers everything and, and more. And I'm always about including everything history, but I like what you all did with cultural history. Uh, a, a spot there to show how the Alamo has been imagined by not only Texans, but Hollywood, uh, USA, the world. And um, so that is part of history as well. So thank it's you. part of the legacy. Yes. Uh, Doug? Hey, Patrick, let me handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> one of the biggest disappointments of going off to college was coming home and finding out that my mother had thrown out my coonskin cap. <laughs> I'll guarantee that they're going to be some for sale. <laughs> I think we have a comment down there. Uh, David? Um, I noticed that you shot the photographs in New York. I guess I'd like to speak up for Texas and getting as many contractors as you are going to need that are Texas-based. And uh, it, it gives me a little... Um, upset stomach to know that if I went and looked at the images in the, um, in the museum when it's through, that those are New Yorkers and not Texans. Those were all Texans. Were they? That all the cool. photo shoot and all the players in the photo shoot were right. from Texas. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, the other one is in the, the early stages of the depiction of the Alamo, will it be depicted in the, in the form that it was during the time of the battle and before. The Throughout. Battle, rather it, than the stupid, whatchamacallit on it. The, oh. the goal is to show the evolution of the site, and that includes all the architecture, and that would include the church and all its different iterations. And, and that's an important part of understanding the footprint of the fort, and not to, I know we've talked about this before, but we're trying every way possible to reinforce for the visitor a sense of understanding of how large, large that fort really was. That'll be represented both in the landscaping and all the way through the main lobby, what was in the paving and the floor, that's part of the fort wall. So we'll be reinforcing everywhere where the, the visitors can go, not only interpretation of what was there, but who lived there and how that space was used. Um, you probably know this already, but there is a very eerie image of the Alamo that was shot in like 1845 or 6 or something that's in the Briscoe collection. And it is, for those of you who have not seen it, you ought to go to the Briscoe collection. You can do that online and look at that image. It is, it's just riveting. Yeah, it's, a, it's very almost ghost-like. It is. It's very ghost-like. It's a good way to put it. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, uh, Patrick, thank you very much. And uh, Thanks, Kate, Jim. does that conclude? I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Easton. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark is here. Okay, great, thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. 
Um, today we're going to be giving you all a brief update on the conservation efforts on the west facade as well as a very, very brief update on the Long Bear Drainage Project. So I'm going to turn it over to David Flory, Easton Architects Conservationist, to give that update. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll admit I'm a little nervous. I'm much more comfortable hanging from a building, crawling under a building. I don't present often, so I apologize if I'm a little bit squeaky. Um, do make sure you stay close to the mic, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is representing an ongoing effort, uh, which is, <clears throat> sorry, I'm gonna get my notes. Um, as part of due diligence, um, uh, one of our first things was just to make sure that we could rep replicate the, the mortar mix that is approved. Um, we've taken advantage of that time to do a couple other things. Um, one is to, um, there's been a charge to improve the color, so we are exploring um, colors based on um, known mission air mortar and known military mortar. We're taking a very methodical approach, um, going quite slowly um, and doing some initial field work, starting in the lab to reduce those mix. And what we learned was um, some of the past documentation, the mortar mix is really just based on a, on a ratio and um, we wanna improve the documentation so that both we are assured of producing that correctly and future generations. Um, so we have um, working with um, uh, people who've worked in the past, the, the contractors work, so that we can actually identify the specific sands, where they come from locally. Um, it is a little difficult because some of the sands are just local sands, but we wanna leave um, as good a legacy as we, we can so that um, that can be reproduced in the future. Um, and we also want to make sure that we have a color that everyone is happy with, because I'm sure you guys know there, even though um, this recipe has been used for a while, sometimes the colors don't always come out quite as, as we might prefer. So that represents this, um, and this just shows some of those initial steps. The initial step is done in the lab. Um, our conservator is matching um, those, those mixes, as I said. Um, this represents that. Um, and then our next steps will be to, again, taking a very methodical and careful approach because of the significance of this site. Um, we will be doing some mini walls where we mock those up. We can see as best we can in a sort of controlled situation how those mortars perform and how um, they cure, making sure that the colors are right. So we'll do each of those in a mini wall used in actual stone that has been pointed, raked out, and then repointed. And then we'll move on to um, doing some select field trials and then full scale field trials and then eventually um, traditional mock-ups to prove that um, everyone involved, um, the conservators, um, are able to replicate that mix and able to perform and implement it properly. Um, another ongoing effort, this has been something that um, Alamo conservator um, Pam Rosser has been working on for a long time and we're gonna join her in that effort. Um, on the west facade there are many renders in different states of either stability or instability. And so we are right now working on a schedule to join Pam on that to, um, uh, to do edge stabilization, which will help um, extend the longevity of these um, finishes and renders. And um, lastly is the idea, we have inherited great information from our predecessors, great drawings, but as we have been working in the past nine months and, and spoken with other people who've worked in, we just want to bump that documentation up a level. Um, this is kind of what we'd inherited, which is great, but we need to, we wanna bump it up a level so that it is formally done at a different scale, so that we've laid this grid on top of it so that we can identify things better. We will number every stone using that grid It'll also allow us some flexibility in, um, in how we approach things over time. We'll be able to identify things by their, by their unit, by their area. We can identify areas that have more or less, for instance, of these renders. Maybe they need more attention than others. It just, and it will also leave a better um, legacy and communication for the generations that come before us. Um, as, 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 and a note, as, as you can imagine, it's very difficult to document this facade. It's, it's not bricks. Um, there's no, nothing as regular, so this will also allow us to be much more specific as time goes on to document every stone exactly. Um, and you'll see in the next one, another component is, oops, wrong way, as they told me. Oops. 
So we'll be blowing it up so that um, we have these, these things to use already blown up, already determined in the field with all of their um, uh, IDs and all, their, all the information. And we will also be able to, since um, with modern technology and because this site is quite accessible, we will also be able to carry on this uh, a yearly um, matching of the drawn with the photograph. So it'll help us with monitoring maintenance over time. Thank and you for that, that presentation, and that was very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a very brief update on the Long Barrack Drainage Project. You all have heard about this in the past. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we understand that this is a very bad drainage condition. The worst condition um, at the Alamo, actually, is it, on, along the east wall of the Long Barrack. And we're trying to address that. And we're also using this as a test pilot for other drainage solutions around both of the artifacts. So currently, the archaeologists are doing their uh, very large-scale investigation. Um, and we now have around five units open against the long barrack before we were up against the WPA wall. Um, and then now we're actually up against a long barrack and we're able to see um, some, some new information. And one of the most interesting things that we have been able to see most recently is we believe that we've been able to identify where um, the 1913 foundations were, uh, or excuse me, the original foundations uh, are versus where the 1913 restoration um, occurred uh, above that. So we still have some vetting out to do, uh, but that was going to be a part of the process to understand where the two interface, how they interface, the different types of materials, uh, the degradation of stone, mortar, uh, and, and how, how do we preserve and stabilize the, the wall. So that was one of the most interesting things that we found just recently over the last uh, few months since we've seen y'all um, previously. The archaeologists have unfortunately lost some time due to, to rain. You know, they can't do anything about that. If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. Um, but it, you know, even in, in small rain event, events, it takes about a week for the, the pits to dry out. And that means that they're you know, not able to work for a week. And that's just not going to work with time frames that we have. Um, so what we desi uh, designed over the last couple months was this uh, temporary drainage solution where we're actually capturing drainage off of the canales, off of the eastern wall. Um, this solution uh, was tested over the weekend, and it works beautifully. So they were able to, even though it rained over the weekend, the archaeologists were able to start working again Monday morning. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, it, it's attached, or excuse me, it's... It's hung kind of on the, uh, we have these hangers that, that hold up the, the, the PVC piping here. Um, it's all gravity. We have uh, gravel bags that, that are holding it on top of the, the parapet. And behind those steel plates, we actually have a very squishy foam so that there isn't going to be any damage to the artifact itself. Um, so there's a lot of safety measures to make sure that it's going to stay up there and it's going to stay in place and not damage the artifact. Um, so that's where we're currently at. Let me see. Oh, yes. And then this is a very beautiful picture of the east wall completely covered. So this is the condition that you'll see at the end of the day to make sure that if there is a rain event, that it is completely protecting all the units out there. Um, it's, it's not specifically pr for protection of the archaeologists. It is all about the units, although we want the archaeologists to also be comfortable. <laughs> Um, but the, the units are what's very important for, uh, to, to keep up with the, uh, uh, the, the schedule and, and, and the needs of the project. Um, so hopefully over the next several months, uh, they'll be able to move uh, at, a, at a very accelerated pace because of this, and we'll be able to have some additional information for you all um, at our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Are there... Uh, yeah. Is there any questions? Yeah, okay. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, I thank you very much. I've, I've got a oh, question. wait, okay, Pete Peterson. So is there a central repository for all the data that's being captured here that beyond, beyond and design data and everything else so that somebody can go back and look and see where we yes. went? Yes, the, the ATI, um, we're not specifically a part of this, but a lot of our data is going to go to ATI, obviously. And they have nearly eight terabytes of data already that we're adding to. So the ATI, they have some archivists that are working on creating a depository for our data, all the other team's data, uh, and the previous team's data as well, so that it's easily, um, that we can easily find in the future. Well, I was hopeful. <laughs> and presumably, Pam, you're keeping track of this, too. Yes, ma'am. Thank yes. you. <laughs>
Norman? Yeah, all I want to do is just comment about how much I enjoy and appreciate the granular attention to yeah. data and care for, for these things and probably the hardest, one of the hardest preservation efforts we, we, we will ever see here. And uh, they're showing us how. Uh, great example for, for other facilities, and we appreciate that very much. You bring, it, bring it on. It'd be great. And I, th I think your word granular is really important. I think that's what we're seeing here, the uh, granular attention to detail, and we really do thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments, seeing none? Oh, one more, Doug, okay. Thank you. Okay, Kate, any more presentation items or are we ready to get into the business? Our last presentation is from Larry from Architexas regarding the Cenotaph investigation. And okay. just feel compelled to say the Cenotaph is remaining where it is today. Um, and the repairs and the restoration that are being proposed will all happen on site. So any repairs to stones and so forth that will, will take place um, will, will be done on the grounds of the Alamo. So I'll turn it over to Larry. Great. Welcome, Larry. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is, let's see if I can. Um, I'm going to give you an update on the findings from our investigation on the Alamo Cenotaph for the SAL permit. Um, and as you're aware, the reason we really undertook this, um, there's several reasons here, but you can see in these photos, there was some movement in the stone, both um, out of plane on the surface of the Cenotaph Monument, and also some horizontal lateral uh, movement that was occurring also. Um, there's also deterioration that's occurring on the marble, um, mainly around the perimeter, different types. There's some little chips on edges. There is spalling, cracking, um, that's occurring around the surface. And we've really determined there's multiple reasons why that's occurring. Um, one of them is the movement of the stones. Um, another is that at one point they did do some repointing with some really hard cementitious mortar um, and that caused some damage. And then they came back in and actually in a repointing process cut out some of that hard mortar and did some additional damage with tools they were using. And then when they came back, they didn't repoint with um, mortar, they repointed with sealant. And that sealant's been in there for several decades and is in quite a deteriorated state. And, you know, is also trapping water that in freeze-thaw, you know, periods is also causing some damage to the surface. So as part of this permit, what um, we're, we also did was we removed very carefully seven stones at the top of the monument. We need to see also what was causing this movement of these stones in the anchorage. And so we took these seven stones off, and then what we also did on the top right, you can see there, we removed um, a small area, about three foot by three foot, of the concrete at the very top so that we could get in and look at the interior of the Santaf Monument. Here on the right, you can see um, we've now removed the stones, and all of the red arrows that you see are actually anchorage points where the, it was aluminum anchors. The aluminum anchors are in the concrete and the brick, but they're not actually attached to the stone cladding. Um, and so that's a big problem. Other ones that we saw were actually at a severe angle, so they really weren't providing proper lateral support. In this photo right here, the blue one is the one on this level that was actually installed properly. So we have some really inadequately installed anchors currently. Um, you can also see in that right photo where the hole is at the top that we cut. Um, on the left photo, you can see at the top of our concrete frame, it's, it's a structural concrete frame with brick infill. There's um, a lot of damage on the concrete. Um, we found that that actually was, didn't occur over time. It actually occurred during construction. That was actually a concrete ledge that was in the design. And by the time they got up to that level of the monument, and they were installing the marble, it, uh, the concrete was out too far. So they literally knocked off what concrete they needed to install the marble, and that exposed some of the rebar also. So going inside, there's actually five of us, I think, that went inside. They're all here today, everybody um, on our team and Pam. Um, they all went inside the um, Cenotaph, probably, the, I guess, the first time in 90 years. So it gave us a great opportunity to see what the conditions were. Um, what you see here is we're kind of at the top level. 
uh, between what we see on the right, five and six, and you can see the um, cast iron downspout is very severely deteriorated. Um, there's water intrusion that's occurring, which we don't want. And it was also full of water all the way to the top, so it was clogged. And so as part of this investigation process, we did unclog it. Um, here on the right, you can see there's actually some um, gypsum salts um, on the surface. This is an area of concentration. This wasn't pervasive throughout, um, but it was something that we found um, was coming through the mortar. Um, so it's really a contaminant that you know, is also contributing to some of the other problems we're having with the concrete. On the left, you can see, um, and we're here between level four and five, some spalling of the concrete on the surface of the beam. This is on the east side. There's solid concrete on the north and south, and on the east and west, we have horizontal beams. Um, as we go down, you can start seeing the, the, the spalling and the exposure of rebar is more severe. Um, and that, this is what was happening on all the beams at especially the middle section of the monument. Um, it was really at this point that, you know, we were, had completed our investigation and, you know, AEC, um, structural engineers who are on our team, recommended that we also get a um, corrosion investigation. So we hired a material scientist, um, ECAM, to come back out to the site since we had access and we, you know, we still had scaffolding in place. Um, this is actually some images from some ground penetrating radar that they did. And what we found was that these beams and some of the other um, areas of concrete where it was exposed that we had very little concrete coverage, inadequate concrete coverage over the rebar. Typically you'd have like an inch and a half, two inches. Um, here you can see where we highlighted on the red, um, it's 0.13 to 0.36, um, very, very shallow, um, which is not good. Um, so we observed that in several areas. They also did some cores in the concrete. Um, what you're looking at here is um, a core, and they've kind of measured in the, the lab how much carbonation's occurred um, in the concrete. Um, what we're seeing is a pretty um, sizable depth of that. It's approximately 1.5 inches on both sides of the concrete. And then what we also found was that our pH was actually quite low. Usually it's around 12. Um, ours was testing it at five, so more towards the acidic range. So this is all really creating an environment where um, the, the concrete is more porous, it's gonna be less durable, and you know, is it, has an environment that's gonna create increased um, corrosion to the rebars. As part of this investigation too, they um, found that the, you know, we have a confined space obviously inside there. There's very, there's some ventilation, but it's pretty small and really not adequate for the area that we have inside of there. So that insufficient airflow and ventilation in the space is really also fostering that increased carbonation. So that needs to get taken care of. So kind of in summary, um, with this investigation, you know, like um, Kate mentioned, you know, it's staying right where it is, where you can undertake this restoration in place, um, not replace any stones. I mean, they're all gonna be the same stones that are here, we're just gonna repair them. Uh, we're gonna reclaim the structural integrity of the structure, um, and so we ensure the visitor safety, and then also preserve the Santaf Monument for future generations, so. Thank, yeah. thank you, Larry. Any questions or comments? Yes, Norman. Quick question. Have you designed the ventilation improvements yet? How, what, what kind of technique are you going to employ, do you think, to accomplish that? Yeah, we haven't yet. Um, that's a really good question, Norman, because a lot of these testing actually just came in recently, okay. too. And we're going to be uh, working with ECHEM on okay. how much we need, how much free area, first of all. And then we're going to figure out how to do it where Aesthetically, you will not see it. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know if that's coming in underground or what, but we're going to figure out a way to ventilate it properly without uh, it being visible. Well, I, I expected as much. That's why I'm really curious about how you pull that off. So <laughs> yeah. we'll be I'll, we'll I'll be get looking. back in with you on Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Yes, Lori. Again, I'll note that we appreciate the very methodical approach. So. Okay. Thank you. Seems like the more we look at into the cenotaphs, the more problems we find and issues that need to be addressed, but it's good we're really getting down to the nitty-gritty of what's happening inside the Cenotaph. Yeah, and in this investigation, we really appreciate the permit for this because 
it really gave us the opportunity to diagnose all the problems that are there and take care of them properly. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now I think we're ready to move into the action items, and I'm going to try to pick up the pace a little bit to uh, uh, move us along here. Uh, so uh, we're into uh, agenda item uh, on, the a a on the commission's agenda, 3.2A, Historic Buildings and Structures Permit. And specifically, we're going to look at a discussion and possible action regarding Historic Buildings and Structures Antiquities Permit Number 1286 for the Alamo Church West Elevation Emergency Cornice Repairs and Select Probes Investigation of the Alamo San Antonio Bear County. And to lead this off will be Elizabeth Brummett, the Director of the Division of Architecture. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners and Antiquities Advisory Board members. I wanted to start by mentioning that uh, Sheena Cox on my staff and I go to the Alamo Monthly. Uh, so we have the opportunity to meet uh, with the experts that the Alamo Trust has assembled and really have uh, an in-depth understanding of what's going on at the Alamo, both in terms of the permits that have already been issued uh, as well as upcoming work. And so uh, in February, we had an opportunity to get on the roof of the Alamo, which was just really instructive in terms of the two scopes of work in this initial permit. Uh, so the first aspect of the permit is uh, has to do with the cap on this cornice on the west facade, the main facade of the Alamo. Uh, this cornice is in need of immediate stabilization measures uh, to ensure retention of the historic fabric, including the stone, uh, the carved details, and the, the um, decorative elements here, as well as remnants of historic renders. Previous repairs occurred in 1994 to 1995, and uh, they weren't uh, executed exactly as they had been specified at that time. And, and um, the conditions that are present are um, they're problematic and really need to be remedied immediately. A uh, sloped cementitious cap was applied uh, with a waterproofing membrane over the top and a metal drip edge that uh, was attached, not according to specification, it was attached with ferrous fasteners. So, uh, there's a potential for rust jacking and damage to the stone from that, uh, the fasteners for that drip edge. Uh, also, over time, that cementitious material has cracked and detached. Um, the slope that is on that material is not consistent, so there are some areas of ponding where water is actually standing against the facade instead of shedding away from it, which was the goal of the intervention. Um, and so it's, it's just really important to get in here and to make um, improvements. The scope of work will be to remove the waterproofing layer and remove part of that cementitious cap uh, through use of handheld grinders and to grind it down to a consistent slope that will shed water. Uh, the metal components will be removed with hand tools and um, then a new waterproofing membrane and flashing will be attached with good attention to the type of fasteners that are used. Uh, the type of waterproofing membrane that's used, um, really trying to make sure that this meets current expectations, uh, both from our perspective with the Secretary of the Interior standards, as well as the American Institute of Conservation's standards for, um, for treatment of sensitive artifacts. Uh, the other aspect of the, uh, the proposed permit is investigations will allow us to better understand the roof structure of the Alamo. Um, so the existing roof dates from uh, 1920 to 1921, and there are multiple conservation concerns that are present with this roof. Uh, prior testing has shown that there is corrosion of the rebar within the roof structure, uh, so that's a concern. Uh, there's also some design issues just with how this roof um, was installed. You can see that there is a very low um, parapet here, There's, there really is no edge, as well as uh, where this barrel vault meets the shaped parapet. Uh, there really is no edge that's holding the water back, and so water is spilling over onto that most sensitive west facade of the Alamo. Uh, there's also, uh, concerningly, failure of the roof membrane in some locations. Uh, so investigations are needed before a, um, a treatment recommendation can be formulated. So what is proposed is uh, to uh, do eight to 10 probes that will be around two feet by two feet in size, uh, four in the interior, four in the exterior, 
that will really allow the design team to understand how the concrete bond beam that was added in 1921, as well as the other aspects of that concrete barrel vault roof, how those intersect with the historic masonry uh, so that we can make some informed decisions about the roof going forward. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions, comments? Yes, Norman. Just a quick question, uh, Elizabeth, looking at some of the photographs we were provided on the, uh, the cornice work on the west wall, th there's a lot of black in these photos. Is that the waterproof membrane uh, that we're removing, or is that some kind of a biological growth, or can you tell me? I, it's, I believe it's biological growth over the waterproofing membrane. Okay, and the waterproofing membrane originally was what? Do we know what, what that um, technology was? I believe it was? was an acrylic polymer. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks very much. Absolutely. That's kind of what I wanted. Any other comments, questions, hearing none? Oh, wait, wait. yes, Rick. Elizabeth, um, in the, you know, there's the, in looking through the documents, a lot of caveats to Secretary of Interior standards and best of conservation methodology. Um, but I, as I know these things go, uh, that really meets the road where the craftsmen are up there. And so much is in this very tentative cornice area is gonna rely upon who's gonna be up there doing the chiseling and the grinding. So I would say, I, I expect that the specifications for this ultimately are gonna be a, a lot more prescriptive, uh, restrictive, prescriptive, and then they're also gonna have some trials of these people uh, before they get up there with the grinders. Yes, I believe there's an intent to, to do a test area before it goes full scale. So there will be an opportunity to make sure that the work's being uh, performed appropriately. I know Pam Rosser also will be on site supervising this work. Um, there's going to be particular attention to areas of the stone that are either currently loose or may become loose over the course of performing this work and making sure that those don't simply fall and shatter. So um, there's a lot of attention to detail in how this is yeah, going to be executed. It's, it's frightening. It's so tenuous. That was a great question, Rick. Uh, I'll just add that um, the specifications are going to require for qualified masons as well as a architectural conservator will be on site with them the entire time that the work is transpiring. Okay. Thank you. Okay, AAB members, it's time for us to uh, move forward. If we could see the motions again. And uh, the first motion is to approve the permit. The second motion is to deny it. Would a member like to move forward a motion by reading it? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move forward motion one. Move to send forward to the commission and recommend authorizing the executive director or his designee to issue historic buildings and structures antiquities permit number 1286 for the Alamo Church West Elevation Emergency Cornice Repairs and Select Probes Investigation Alamo Church, the Alamo, San Antonio, Bear County, and to manage subsequent field changes as necessary. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The motion carries. Now, uh, commissioners, it's time for us to take action based upon the recommendation of the Antiquities Advisory Board. I move to authorize the Deputy Executive Director for Preservation Programs or his designee to issue historic buildings and structures antiquities permit number 1286 for the Alamo Church West Elevation Emergency Cornice Repairs and Select Probes Investigation Alamo Church, the Alamo San Antonio Bear County and to manage subsequent field changes as necessary. Is second. Is, motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, Elizabeth, we're on to the next uh, permit, and this is the uh, permit structures antiquities permit uh, 1287 for the comprehensive restoration of the cenotaph. Yes, I'd like to thank Larry Ersick for that excellent presentation that really sets the stage for what we need to talk about today. Um, before I dive in, though, I wanted to show you a, a current photo of the cenotaph with the intervention that the Antiquities Advisory Board and Commission approved at the last quarterly meeting. Um, so you'll see a slight variation in color up here at the top. That is the, uh, the temporary waterproofing uh, that was put in place, and uh, the stones are staged on site uh, close to the base of the cenotaph. Uh, so this is the condition that things will remain in until um, 
if the commission authorizes this permit until that work proceeds. Um, so there are a number of concerning issues going on with the Cenotaph, and uh, I, will, I will go through this in the order that it's presented in the motion page, uh, starting with the work that we have um, you know, known from the outset as soon as, as those stones come off, uh, that we have problems with anchorage. And so there was a, a certain scope of work that um, we knew when we uh, sent the motion page out and the original quarterly meeting packet. Then I'll go over the, um, the additional investigations and added scope that uh, we recently discovered would be needed. Um, so the project requires removal and reinstallation of many of the stones of the shaft of the Cenotaph um, in order to be able to address those anchorage concerns. Uh, we have a number of these marble panels are in, in essence being held in place by the force of gravity. They're not tied back appropriately to the concrete substructure. Uh, so in order to remedy that situation, the, the non-decorative stones we know for certain do need to come off um, in order to allow that proper anchorage to be done and to address the, um, the carbonation concerns and degradation of the concrete substructure. Um, so the methodology that will be used is to uh, remove these um, large pieces of stone as whole units from mortar joint to mortar joint with no cutting or damage to the stone. And we know that this work can be executed successfully based on the stones that were removed at the top without any damage. Um, the mortar will be removed from uh, the stone and uh, they will be labeled and placed on site uh, in preparation for the reinstallation. Non-corrosive shims will be used to set stones upon the reinstallation and the mortar joints will be repaired to match the existing original joint width. The type of mortar that's used will match the existing in terms of its uh, color and texture and will be of a strength that the stone conservator recommends. Um, the additional work that we need to evaluate whether or not it's necessary um, is to determine how far that carbonization and degradation of the concrete extends. Um, so the, the investigation that was done you know, did allow access at the top. It allowed access from the interior of the shaft. But what we, we don't know is necessarily the condition at the base of the monument. So what is proposed is to dig a test pit to allow a concrete core at the foundation of the monument to be taken and also to carefully remove a single stone um, within that, that darker pink area at the base. One will be selected that does not have any decorative carving, so none of the names, none of the sculptural pieces. It will be a, a blank piece, but to allow access down at the bottom portion of the monument um, for an additional coring so that we can understand whether the extent of carbonation and degradation is as extensive at the base as it is at the top. And on the basis of those findings, we will then know if the entirety of the monument needs to be dismantled. Um, so this is a decision that won't be taken lightly. Um, if there is any way to avoid going to that extent, uh, that certainly is the intent, is to do as little as possible while still ensuring the long-term structural integrity of the monument. Um, if additional marble, decorative marble at the base um, does need to be removed, it will be performed. That work will be performed with the highest level of sensitivity so that no damage occurs during that process. Uh, additional testing is also needed for the relative humidity and temperature within the shaft of the monument in order to determine if, if those ventilation improvements are needed. Um, so, in essence, what we are asking for is approval and concept, approval of the methodology that's been laid out for testing and decision making and authorizing staff to move this forward. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine and are aware from the many presentations that you've received, there are a lot of moving pieces at the Alamo. And so the work on the Cenotaph impacts um, your work in the plaza and other work that they have planned and scheduled. So. Um, the team has asked that we go ahead and, and consider it today, even though we don't have the full recommendation. We have an approach for how we'll make those decisions. Yeah, just a quick quick comment that I uh, appreciate, the, again, the, the detail in the presentations. And, and certainly, you all have demonstrated, I think, very clearly that the, uh, the ability to dismantle the Cenotaph, if needed, is is very feasible with minimal impact on historic fabric 
And it, it's easy to me to see how doing so, uh, far, the advantages of doing so and getting down and giving a good investigation to the concerns that we've got down there far outweighs the risks involved. And so I, I applaud that approach and encourage you to not be too timid about uh, really looking and seeing what's going on down in there. Because as we all know, we're going to do this about once a hundred years, and uh, this needs to be a hundred year fix for sure. And we've got some, there have been a little technological advancement since 1930s, and so uh, we have ways to, of doing this, doing this better. Uh, and and uh, I think we should take full advantage of that opportunity. Thank you. So, Norman, that's a perfect setup for you to read. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, okay. A question over here. Oh, multiple questions. Well, but I will do that. All right. Mm -hmm. sure. hmm? um, just a quick question. So, I assume that if you are able to dismantle and really get down there, it's actually probably less expensive to do all the work that needed to be done because you could really, um, you know, re get into the bowels of everything and, and do it uh, at, at less cost. Yes, it's also a matter of the, the carbonation coming in from both sides of the concrete, um, from the outside where the stone units are, as well as from the inside of the shaft. And so if that condition exists at the base, what's needed in order to um, treat the concrete, uh, restore its alkaline um, uh, pH and to improve some waterproofing in those areas, it would require access to the concrete in order to be able to make those interventions if the conditions are present. And one more comment by Lori. Yes, um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I, uh, as a bit of a counter to your comment, Norman, I do think that it's uh, prudent and wise to do further investigation down lower. Um, as an aid to developing the, the strategy of treatment for the whole monument. So I fully endorse this. And Norman's going to make the motion, but I'll support it. But first, are any other questions, comments? No? So Norman, it's up to you to pick one of the motions. Well, I'll see. Which, <laughs> which, which door will we look behind today? Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to uh, select motion one. Mr. Chairman, move to send forward to the commission and recommend authorizing the executive director or his designee to issue historic buildings and structures antiquities permit number 1287 for the comprehensive restoration of the Cenotaph, the Alamo, San Antonio, Bear County, contingent upon the receipt of updated construction documents and to manage the subsequent field changes as necessary. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Uh, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Opposed? Chair, may I make one other comment? I have full confidence in our staff and in the design team, and so it's likely that action will occur on this before our next meeting, and I'm confident that it will be well handled. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, motion. updated construction documents and to manage subsequent field changes as necessary. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So uh, there's the motion. Do we have a second? I seconded. Motion and second. Uh, any further discussion? I hope not. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. The uh, motion carries. And finally, AAB members, I want to thank you for a marathon three-hour uh, meeting. Uh, we really appreciate <laughs> your, uh, uh, your input and advice, and uh, uh, you help us out tremendously. So thank you very much. And at this point, I turn the microphone back over to THC Chairman John Now. Thank you, and thank you to the AAB members. Uh, obviously, it's longer than normal, but we address some very critical issues. I do want to wait, make one comment on the Cenotaph. I had some discussions, Kate knows this. There is some discussion about transferring, uh, I'll call it or, uh, 
ownership or jurisdiction on the land. I absolutely made it clear and got the guarantees that it doesn't talk about moving the Senate tap. Senate tap stays just as it's a bureaucratic who's going to own the ground out there. If you hear it coming up, don't worry, it, Senate tap staying where the heck it is. Okay. Kate, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let me consult with the co chair. Where did you leave it? Are we good? No, we're not there. Okay, number four, Governor's Mansion. Erica, come on up here. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. It's great to be with you. Um, really excited to update you briefly on Friends of the Governor's Mansion and our annual report. All right. Is the meeting over? <laughs> Okay, in addition to our routine maintenance and conservation, we have several recently completed and ongoing projects that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, the first is we recently completed conservation of the book collection. A few years ago, we actually had a conservator come and inspect all of the books in the collection and give recommendations on conservation. We have wrapped up that project at the end of 2023 and are really excited um, about that. Uh, we also acquired a reproduction of the back entry rug. So that took some time to get uh, an exact replica that now we can rotate in and out of service. Um, that particular rug is um, singularly facing. So basically it can't be rotated like other rugs in the collection. So what we do is we rotate it in and out um, with its partner. And um, we also are currently having uh, the Jefferson pattern, the Picard China reconditioned. Um, this is going to be a multi-tier project where we've sent half of it off. This is China from the Shivers administration as well as the Clements administration. Um, so we're really excited to get that underway. And then we also are um, reproducing textiles in the public rooms. So as you can imagine, some of the draperies are over 40 years old and they're a little bit um, faded and worn. And so we are having exact replicas made of draperies um, the upholstery fabrics, as well as some of the rugs in the upstairs bedrooms. Um, again, these are all the public rooms. We're raising private funds for this. Um, and we're really addressing things based off of need. We started with the conservatory. Now we're working on the small and large parlors, as well as the Sam Houston bedroom. Um, and we've really been working uh, painstakingly with our design partners to make sure um, that the trims and the fabrics are exactly um, what was hung in the 1982 Clements Restoration when the uh, collection uh, was acquired and the design plan complete. So staying true to that time period. Um, we also are raising um, funds for furniture conservation. This is for the items that are being reupholstered with the new fabric. Um, anytime you recover something, you discover issues that are hidden underneath um, the fabric, and so we'll be addressing that. We're also raising funds for the Rita Crocker Clements Fund, which is an endowment for furniture conservation, as well as the Ashley Pretty Landscape Fund, which funds um, plantings on the mansion grounds and then um, supporting educational materials as well. So really excited about this project. We've um, had a great fundraising effort and nearly wrapping it up and um, just really pleased about that. All right, I included this picture. This is the photo of the conservatory. We actually have had those drapes replicated and rehung. So we've taken down the old drapes, put them in storage for now. Um, and if you were to walk in the conservatory in January of last year versus January of this year, you really wouldn't notice anything. It just feels refreshed. Um, and you just see really exact replica of what was put in place in 1982. And we're really proud of that. Um, any questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Erica, thank you for everything you do for the mansion, and uh, looks pretty good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, a little better than my dining room. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. To the friends of the THC, and I see Sally Ann's here, the chair. So. Yes. Hello. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Sally Ann Schmidt, chair of the board of the. 
trustees of the Friends of the Texas Historical Commission. Our executive director, Anjali Zucci, is presenting a pre-conference workshop right now. And so I will be making the presentation for us. Since, oh, whoops, sorry. Usually I don't have to do this. Okay. Since we're here at the Renaissance and the beginning of the Real Places 2024, I will start with our report on the activities with the Community Heritage Development Division. The Friends of THC is thrilled to be co-hosting the Real Places 2024 with the THC. We have completed our sponsorship and underwriting outreach for Real Places, and we have $159,670 in confirmed sponsorships and underwriting. This includes our title sponsorship from Phoenix One and a generous grant from the City of Austin's Economic Development Department from their Heritage Austin Grants Program. The sponsorship also includes support from the Texas Land Title Association for the Courthouse Stewardship Track. We have 20 confirmed partners in preservation and four media partners. In other related news um, related to the CHD division, the Friends has received approval from the state of Georgia for the li licensing scope of work, and we're in the middle of contract signing with the vendor InfoStride, after which we will work with our IP attorney to complete the li licensing agreement for downtown TX. As always, a large portion of our work is focused on historic sites. Starting with Caddo Mounds, we have a few updates to share. We have submitted a $500,000 grant to the TLL Temple Foundation and we're awaiting their decision. We have also a request going to the Keller Foundation for 200,000 next week and we have a request into the Santa Fe National Tobacco Company Foundation as well as other letters of inquiry that have been submitted to Texas foundations. Goodnight Ranch, a recap. I don't think this is the right slide. Okay, well, I think we're over. Uh, a recap on Goodnight Ranch acquisitions. As you recall, there are two properties that the Friends is working on acquiring on behalf of THC. Both properties are part of the original cultural landscape of the Goodnight Ranch with critical historical and archeological resources that need to be protected and interpreted. These acquisitions are a priority and they will also greatly increase THC's ability to protect the historic ranch house as well as protect the view shed from the house um, to the house from the highway, which impacts visitation as well. The two properties are indicated here. We have the 16.81 acre Garland Homestead, which is now owned by the heirs of the late Mr. Jim Garland. There's actually, there are the three tracks on the left, you can see them. And then we have the 14.37 acre Herdware, retail store property, which is owned by Mr. Cecil Miskin, and that's the tract on the right along um, the highway. As far as the status of the acquisitions is concern concerned, um, here we go. The Herdware retail store property is under contract. The survey has been completed completed and sent to the title company, and our closing is scheduled for the week of April 22nd. Subsequent closing with THC is expected no later than July 31st. On the Garland property, uh, we had to resolve the issue of two very small um, undocumented tracts of land. You can see them here in the red. The survey that was done in Mr. Garland's property in August of 22 did not clarify the ownership of these tracks. Um, Anjali has worked with, um, this is, there's different slides that I'm showing on my report and on the thing, but anyway. Anjali's worked with the owners and their attorney to resolve this, which has now been done. The heirs of the Garland, of Mr. Garland, have filed an affidavit of use and possession for the 0.5 acres 
of land with the county and that has now been recorded and it's official. Following this, we now have a purchase agreement in place with Mr. Garland's heirs. The survey update is in process. A recap of the numbers here we have. The overall purchase price of these two properties, including the expected closing costs, is $1.055 million. And the Friends is very thankful to Chairman now for the no interest loan of $1 million that he's given us, which allows us to complete these acquisitions and secure these critical properties for THC without additional costs. With the approved funding authority of the $1 million, there is a funding gap of $55,000, and we're also grateful to Chairman Now for his challenge to pledge $20,000 towards this gap. The, T the Friends of the THC is in the process of raising the remaining funds with requ requests submitted to the Tecovis Foundation, Amarillo National Bank, and additional um, individuals. I also want to take this minute to recognize Friends board member and my colleague Wes Reeves for his help and guidance in moving these acquisitions forward. His deep relationship within the Amarillo community allowed us to make the appropriate connections that we needed to work through to getting the purchase agreements in place and to get in contact with the Garland heirs. Um, apparently they were Facebook friends. We look forward to updating you on the closing as it happens later this month. Anjali and um, HSD leadership has had their second meeting with the members of the Presidio La Bahia Foundation in February to discuss the details of the gift agreement. The total amount of the gift transfer will be over $1.2 million, and the funds will be transferred from the Presidio La Bahia Foundation to the Friends of the THC, for the use and benefit of the Presidio La Bahia State Historic Site. A draft gift agreement is due to the foundation in the next week. Once approved, the agreement will be signed and the funds will be transferred by the deadline of May 1st. The Friends continues to support the Washington on the Brazos Historical Foundation on their capital campaign. As you recall, the Historical Foundation had a campaign goal of $10,415,000 to be raised in private funds for the capital improvements at Washington on the Brazos. Anjali has shared a detailed um, memo with Chairman and Now and Joseph Bell, but I wanted to share a few highlights. Chairman Now's $2.5 million challenge launched the campaign and motivated many donors to match. To date, the Historical Foundation has raised over $3.1 million in donations and pledges, thereby meeting his challenge. New gifts and conversations include the items in red. The gift from the Fondren Foundation is confirmed. The Keller Foundation is considering a $1 million naming opportunity. A decision from the Brown Foundation is expected in this summer. The foundation and the campaign chairs Jim Colcourse and Cindy Smith hope to get the chairman's guidance on some specific North Texas area donors next. The foundation does not, I'm sorry, the foundation does expect to finish the campaign by the projected date of December 31st, 2024. Preservation Scholars, um, one of the Friends Trustees favorite programs. The application period for the new cycle of Preservation Scholars is now closed. T Friends staff and the program committee have reviewed the applications and have selected another great cohort of seven students to come in as the Preservation Scholars class of 2024. We're in the process of getting their contracts signed and we look forward to sharing details about um, the scholars and their work at our July meeting. I want to thank our board member Donna Carter and advisory board member Robert Oliver for their continued support for this program. For the seventh year of the, in the row, we've received a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation in support of this program. With this support, the annual endowment distributions and an annual board director gift the Friends will be able to fully cover the stipends and a housing allowance 
for the students in 2024. Virtual events, another great friends project. The Friends of the THC launched its 2024 schedule in February with one of the best states of all, Russell Lee's Photographs of Texas, 1939 to 1959, presented by historian and author Mary Jane Apple. The event was very well received with over 400 registrants. Just last week, we presented Uncover the Hidden Stories of Route 66, presented by Executive Director of Latinos and Heritage Conservation and Friends Board Member, Sela Moda Casper. With this 44th event completed since March 2021, the Friends has engaged over 12,800 people through direct registrations and over 35,000 through our live streaming on Facebook. We've reached over 28 states and multiple countries and continue to gain new and repeat donors who donate as a result of these programs. Upcoming events include April 18th, Trained in Texas, the inspiring story of the women Air Force service pilots of World War II, presented by Dr. Katherine Landek, Professor of History at Texas Women's University. May 23rd, Black Soldiers in the Lone Star State, Black Soldiers on Texas Military Posts during World War II, presented by Cale Carter. And June 20th, History of Japanese Farmers in Texas, presented by Sydney Liu, um, from Rice University. We hope you'll um, join us on these workshops. Our development workshops continue to be very popular with attendance from across Texas and from other states as well. And we're doing this pre-conference um, workshop with Anjali right now. We also have a new contract social media coordinator, Arnold Rousseas, who brings a wealth of experience in various social platforms. You may notice a little bit of a change up to our social media platforms. And we look forward to presenting some updates from Arnold at our, on our social media activity in July. In conclusion, here are numbers um, for the quarter that ended March 1st. Um, these numbers do not reflect the loan received in March for the Goodnight Acquisitions from Chairman Now. Um, but once again, um, the Friends of the THC is in healthy financial shape. So I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you might have. And we also have Friends Development Manager, Christy Pelican, here as well to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. A quick question, Joseph, when you get to the good night issue, could you address whether or not, do we need TxDOT to approve signage out on that highway or can we do it ourselves? Maybe we're gonna deal with it now. <laughs> good question. We can deal with the signage that's behind the right of way, but we would need to start working on them for signage along the highway Right. Um, because that's lacking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. And Joy, the Texas Holocaust Advisory Commission, a somewhat appropriate discussion right now. Absolutely. Please. Um, good morning. I'm Joy Nathan. I'm the Executive Director of the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. With me this morning to give the report is our new vice chair. Her name is Sandra Parker. Um, she's from San Antonio. Take it away. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Chairman Now, Vice Chairman, Commissioners, for having me. As Joy said, my name is Sandra Parker, and I'm the vice chair of the Texas Holocaust Genocide Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. Regrettably, Ken can't be here today. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we are pleased to say that our commission currently has seven of its nine commissioners appointed. It's been a slow process, but we've reached a critical number that a quorum is not so elusive, so we appreciate that. Um, we're working with the governor's appointments office to fill the remaining two. We held our last quarterly meeting, March 6th in Houston, and there we established our executive committee, which we had to do per the administrative code, heard from lots of guests, including Senator Brandon Creighton, 
um, who's a champion for education and shared some of his educational directives for the next legislative session to address anti-Semitism specifically on college campuses, which regrettably since the war in Israel started October 7th, has been on the rise dramatically. In terms of policy, we're pleased to say that in consultation with our commissioners, Governor Abbott issued an executive order last week to fight this increase of anti-Semitism on college campuses in the state of Texas to ensure a safe learning environment for Jewish students and all Texans. The executive order, among other things, directs college campuses to include the working definition of anti-Semitism in their policies. This definition is something that has already been codified in the Texas government code. It is the working definition on the federal level through the State Department of the United States, more than 30 member countries of the International Holocaust Remembrance Commission use this definition as well, in addition to more than 30 states have already adopted this definition in some form. So Texas is not shooting from the hip. This is a well-established definition that is being used. And the governor's EO requires that this be implemented at all college and university campuses, which is a really important example of Texas leading from the front on this issue and unequivocally which of course is in stark contrast to what we all witnessed on Capitol Hill several months ago when in front of the Education Committee when several deans of Ivy League universities were asked repeatedly whether or not calling for the genocide of the Jewish people violated their codes of conduct at every single answer. They each said it depends on the context. So this EO provides the important context that uh, allegedly is lacking for some. <clears throat> in terms of our deliverables, in partnership with the Texas Education Agency as a part of our mandate, we set out a survey to all Texas school districts during Holocaust Remembrance Week. We sent it to over 4,600 schools. We had a threshold of 50% that needed to respond. We surpassed that threshold in terms of the, res in terms of the respondents, so we we're very happy about that, so we are analyzing that data now. And this month, we will interview schools and partnership organizations from the four Holocaust museums in our state as we create recommendations to support Holocaust education and issue the Holocaust Remembrance Week report due to the legislature by December 1st. We recognize the importance of working with educators as opposed to merely mandating to educators. Our educators in the state of Texas have a lot on their plates and it's important that we get their guidance when we're talking about the appropriate ways in which to teach these hard lessons to our students. Um, in addition to the Holocaust Remembrance Week report, our commission will issue the second study of anti-Semitism in the state of Texas, which is due uh, legislatively by November the 1st, 2024. Some happy news with regards to resources. Uh, I'm pleased to share that our Friends Commission has been awarded a quarter of a million dollar grant from the Moody Foundation to provide resources and materials to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. Again, unfortunately, college campuses appears to be ground zero. Um, for this fight right now, more so ever since the war broke out. For some background, um, the Moody Foundation approached our newly formed Friends organization, which your commission has so generously helped us in terms of guidance to create. And they actually met out of cycle to approve this fund because they knew that time was of the essence. And so we are pleased to now have that in hand. Uh, the Moody's recognize that uh, the will to fight without the resources is, is somewhat powerless. Moving on, our Friends Commission has held three successful parlor meetings in Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. And in addition to the quarter of a million dollars that we received from the Moody Foundation, we also raised over $30,000 at those three parlor meetings. So it's excellent to have buy-in at the local level for the work that we're doing from community stakeholders outside of organizations that do similar work that we do. We are building the budget and the leadership structure for Friends right now, and we thank the Friends of THC for their continued guidance and support here. Uh, looking forward, April is Genocide Awareness Month, and please visit our website so you can see the commemorations and opportunities to learn more about other genocides, including the Armenian Genocide, the Rwandan Genocide, and as we look ahead, May is Jewish American, Jewish American Heritage Month. 
And we look forward to partnering with the THC to share stories of the Jewish community's history and their contribution to Texas. I know our commissions have a shared goal of ensuring that anti-Semitism truly does become a relic of the past and something to be studied in the annals of history as opposed to a present scourge, which we must fight every day. Uh, lastly, our next quarterly meeting will be on June 5th in Austin, and this concludes my quarterly report. Please to answer any questions or comments. Commissioners? Thank you, and you referenced uh, the governor's proclamation. Yes, sir. Could we get, could I get copies of it, please? Yes, sir. I'll have yeah. Joyce send that to your office. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to number seven. It's the easiest thing we do. <laughs> the consent items. Commission may approve agenda item 7.1 through 7.5 by a majority vote on a single motion. Any commissioner may request that an item be pulled from this consent agenda for consideration as a separate item. Commissioners, does any commissioner have a consent item that should be taken separately? Yes. Uh, not to be taken separately, but I don't know if all the commissioners, or I hope all the commissioners were able to look at uh, 7.4. Could you get the mic closer to okay. you, please? 7.4, which is uh, the uh, survey of employee engagement. That is a tool uh, that actually we discovered back in the early 2000s and used it to help elevate the morale of the of the staff, basically. It's dis has disappeared for a while, but now it's back, and I applaud the fact that it's in the consent agenda and would ask all the commissioners to pay attention to that report. It's really important. And I, I'd like to make a comment related to that. Uh, I, I've learned recently that um, uh, we do that every two years, and there's an action plan, and that those action plans have not been followed through with is one of the reasons why our scores have been stuck where they are. So I'm confident now with uh, that what I heard yesterday that the action plan will be followed through with and, and monitored carefully. Uh, to both of you, I happen to agree with the importance. I do think we've got to figure out how to move that needle, and it isn't going to be done simply by getting a survey. It's going to be up to leadership I'm going to, your chairman's going to take a particular interest in this. We've got to move the needle on the employee's view of their job and importance. What's going to be very difficult is moving this pay needle mm -hmm. because it's not in our control completely. That's a budget function. And I, I'll say this in an employee group. I don't think the commission itself is the issue, and I know that leadership of the commission, executive directors and the uh, chairs are the problem. This will be a fight in the legislature, pure and simple. So I think we're going to have to manage what we can manage and recognize that that's a little bit out of our control. So. Uh, want everybody to be clear on that. But that report I saw yesterday was the best I've seen in many, many years, to your point, Jim. And Mr. Chairman, I, a few, three or four years ago, you asked me to look at that yep. survey, and I spent a lot of time and did a detailed report identifying some areas of improvement and developed an action plan, which I now learn was not really followed through with, which is disappointing for all the effort I put into that. <laughs> Mr. Well, Chair. To, uh, being a little bit, therefore, it still waits to be implemented. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair. Do you have, you know, one second, do you have a good copy of that? Yes. Oh, and I've, I've given that to uh, Dr. Egali, the plan. Um, 
send it to me too. We, okay. Uh, I've moved yeah. offices since then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is not lost on me that the division director, after we discovered this tool, the vi division director that took it most seriously is sitting right over there. His name was Jim Broussard. He took it seriously. When I was on staff, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, chairman, on a different um, item, but belonging to these consent items, just for a matter of record, item 7.2 and item 7.3 that were delegated to the history committee because of a lack of quorum, we didn't make an action, but they have now fallen upon the commission and we will take action with them. And the history committee had no, we were in agreement. There was no um, disagreement about them. So just for the record, we did want to state that. Hey, but you, you're okay yes. moving forward. We're, we're All right, good. got it. All right, again, uh, do, are there any consent items that should be taken into consideration separately? <laughs> I'm hearing the comments, but the answer is no. No. All right. Uh, do I have a motion? We have approval, Mr. Chairman. Yes. We have a motion and a second. Any objections? Being none, I call for a vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, Jim, do you want to, you, you have pretty well run your archaeology meeting, right? We, we did, and uh, uh, I don't know if Brad's here, but Brad, I don't know if we need to, I think all the members were here yesterday and heard the um, report for the archaeology division. I think we probably can pass on that unless you have something new from yesterday. Okay, we'll, we will pass. Okay, and as we flip the page, I'm going to call a 10-minute uh, break. Okay, it is... 11.50, let's, we'll get started back up at straight noon. All right, thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, will begin in two minutes, please. We're going to start in one minute, folks. Do we have a full commission back here? All right, we're back. It is 12.04. We'll go to architecture. Lori? I'm sorry. I took a bite. I thought a minute was longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at um, least you got something to eat. True. We had a lovely meeting yesterday, a nice update. 
and we are happy to pass unless the commission would like to hear. I, I only want to note one thing is that we're losing a valued employee. Caroline Wright has chosen to take early retirement um, and that'll be a great loss that we'll feel. So mm. she was a great contribution. So did you all have questions for us or do you wanna? Any questions? Being none, we'll move to community heritage development. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We had a meeting yesterday, and I think most of most of us were here. So I'm going to let Brad do an abbreviated um, <coughs> spiel. All right. By now, you know there's a conference starting around us. So next slide. I do want you to be able to visually see our sponsors that without without whom we cannot pull this conference off. So memorize all of those logos, please. Um, <laughs> especially that John L. Now one. Um, <laughs> next slide. Next slide. Uh, we're in great shape uh, relative to our participation. 800 total plus total participants if all goes well. Next slide. Next Hold slide. On, wait, wait a minute. Oh. Go back one. Again. Are you saying 800? These are the 477 plus are paid registrants. So when you add speakers, sponsors, partners, staff, um, you end up with 820 was the last number that I saw. Get it. Thank you. Uh, we talked about all that. Uh, we can skip that. Um, we had a good conversation. Uh, maybe there's one more slide. Next slide, actually. Um, so we had a conversation in the committee um, discussing the fact that we don't, because of the Main Street setup that we currently have, we don't have a traditional First Lady's tour in 2024. Uh, at Vice Chair McKnight's uh, suggestion in a prior conversation, we wanted to look at whether there are other opportunities this year in 2024 to engage with the First Lady for possible events or other opportunities. I want to emphasize that the discussion was not intended to uh, suggest a complete replacement in the future of the First Lady's tour, but I did want the committee and commissioners to understand some of the challenges um, that we overcome every time and presumably can continue to overcome uh, with the First Lady's tour. Um, but we primarily <coughs> were talking about opportunities. Um, these were just some that were suggested that we already know the commission has different things. A few of these, like the Mason County Courthouse, Mr. Chairman, we haven't cleared with you to make sure that's coming from the county that um, you or appropriate representation of the commission would be available for that. <clears> the <throat> same with some of the internal, more stakeholder meetings like the trails. Um, so they're up here as tentative because we haven't, we haven't cleared those things. Um, but that was, this is, was a commission agenda, agenda item, but not action. So if there's anything the commissioner, a commissioner wanted to add to that conversation, we can do that or we can move on. Well, number one, on Mason County, when are they going to have their date? They uh, they are telling they are recommending requesting July thirteenth, which is a Saturday. It it corresponds to some local events, um, and so that's partly why I think they're they're trying to rally around that. And as often is the case with counties. Uh, they get ahead of they get ahead of uh, us on when they think the date is going to be, and sometimes they get ahead of the construction schedule. Hey, um, I could the this first lady and all of them that I've been involved with back to Mrs. Bush, they really like the First Lady events. Now, it seems that we're not having that because of problems with the Main Street effort, not lack of her interest. It would be, before I go talk to her or her staff, it would be helpful to know 
what will be the status of, of Main Street a year from now? Because we can, we can, we can prognosticate. Well, uh -huh. yeah, I, and since it's a pretty good program, if we're not going to do it, uh, we need a real good reason. Okay, all right, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I don't anticipate that uh, we would have a problem having one or more new Main Street communities in 2025. Hopefully with enough time to be able to plan that. But um, we're getting the associate network, the new entry process underway. And so unless there ends up being zero demand, which would suggest a different problem, um, we should be able to make 2025 work. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta go out and create your own, but I get it. I just hope we don't unilaterally pull the plug. Oh, I don't think, that's not, that's not, okay. a, uh, that's not any intent. Uh, any other? I think we're good. Nope. All right. Uh, Commissioner Donnelly, communications, finance, and all things beautiful. <laughs> uh, Chairman, we had a good meeting yesterday. Uh, not a whole lot to report. Uh, the the uh, budget looks on track from uh, Mr. Estrada, so I don't. I think we've got everything there. We did. I did want to point out we had a, a pretty good discussion around the procurement process and kind of the technical debt that the, the agencies accumulated over the years and the path forward in that and the committee's going to take a pretty sharp eye on keeping up with that and how, how those, uh, uh, how we uh, reclaim that technical debt back. And I think that's everything. Okay. I, I, I may be jumping ahead. No, could I get that back up, please? Maybe this is a question for Joseph, but the historic site's budget versus expended is a big issue. I didn't want to bring it up yesterday because I wanted to bring it up today. Where are we on this? Because I'll be getting questions. Uh, a number of the uh, projects are under um, assessment and we've got requests for proposals out there. And as soon as we award contracts, the largest being for San Jacinto, um, that one, it would be, that's the one that's really kind of out there as part of that 157 million um, that is still up, needing to be obligated. And so that's, is it 157 plus 11 versus the two, 213. Is it that? Yes, it's um, the uh, right now the budget is at $213 million uh, for um, historic sites right. and it's expended 11 million and we've obligated 157. So it's 157 plus 11, 163. So there's a different, there's a balance still there that have yet to be encumbered for various projects mm -hmm. or expended uh, that were provided for capital projects. Yeah, I don't want to be speaking out, speaking out of order. But get me on a document where the rest of that un unencumbered or uncommitted, where we think it's going. Okay. All right. Thank you. Pardon? Yeah, it's a relatively big number. Okay. Uh, Garrett, anything else? No, sir. All right. Commissioner Crane, historic sites. Joseph's um, already at the mic. Yes. Uh, yesterday, I thought, was a phenomenal meeting with the historic sites. Uh, I think that was very, very educational for hmm. everyone, including commissioners. <laughs> yep. And uh, I think that kind of presentation was, was very, uh, uh, very good. Great. And so, uh, if you have some short comments, Joseph, and then we'll get the action items. The one thing I wanted to uh, uh, tell the uh, commissioners that the historic site, um, com the, the managers would like to extend their thank you for all your support and your interest in their operations. Um, they were very um, excited about being here for the commission meeting 
and in the future we're going to try to align that more so that you'll have more of an opportunity to really kind of uh, know the people who are in charge out there. Um, and, um, and they were very pleased about the structure that we were able to do to really kind of highlight the complexity and the diversity of, of historic sites operation, which was not really kind of visible to the commission in the past. So um, I'm pleased with how we were able to present that for you. Commissioner Crane, I have a quick question to ask. Yes. yes. Uh, can, um, uh, can, do you have an updated organizational chart of historic sites? Yes. We do. I, if you could send that to me and maybe other commissioners, I'd like to really understand what that looks like. I, I got a good understanding of it yesterday, but to see it in a chart would be wonderful. How we have the departments all broken down? Yeah, correct. I will get that out to everyone. Uh, the first thing that we have on the uh, for motion is the Iwo Jima operating um, uh, agreement. And there was a few changes that we had gone over um, with defining the site boundaries um, making sure that we had you know, clarification about the earned revenue um, that was going to be used for the museum and the Marine Military Academy. Um, ins insurance requirements, we clarified those. And then the dispute resolution, those were the three changes that we did in the operating agreement. Um, so we would uh, recommend approval um, moving forward with that operating agreement as crafted. I will make a motion, move to approve the Iwo Jima Operating and Land Use Agreement. Second. Okay. There's a second to any discussion. I have a yes, one, just one question. Since there is a grave at the monument, is that included or in our responsibility or the school's? It will be parts of the school's responsibility, but as we have talked to them, we want to make sure that as we develop the museum, there will be a continual expansion of the operating agreement because we can't do the museum without the grave and without the, the monument itself. Um, the, the issue was that they just wanted to make sure they had control over ownership. And I told them that that was fine, but we wanted to make sure that ownership on both sides included the, in total, the total visitor experience. Okay, John, we've just got to make certain of that when we get to the final agreement. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. <clears throat> next. The next one is the, uh, at San Jacinto, the uh, donation from David Hill of the 14th. Wait a minute, oh, we didn't we need vote, to vote. I'm sorry. Go we, back. Yeah, I'm just racing ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any further discussion on uh, Iwo Jima? We need a motion. Better. We, we got one. We, got we, have, we, we got got a second. have a motion. And a Just second, need a vote. So we'll vote all in favor. Say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay. We go. Yep. The next item is the uh, donation of the 14.74, the 74 acres from David Hill, um, and we were working diligently to um, make sure that we meet all the requirements from David. Um, so staff is recommending that we move forward. Give the uh, give me the ability to work with David to finalize whatever is needed to ensure that his um, tax re requirements with his attorney are met. Um, so we'll go to the um, motion. Uh, before I read the motion, I just think it's great that this is finally being ironed out. And uh, I want to thank you and everybody participating uh, on this matter because we've talked about the acquisition of this David Hill yep. property for some time. Motion is moved to authorize Joseph Bell, Deputy Executive Director of Historic Sites, to accept the donation of real property located at Park Road 38 in the Brazos River in San Felipe, Texas, and also referred to as the David Hill property. That's the motion. Is there second. a second? A second? Second. Okay, we have a second. Discussion. Hearing none, we'll vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion aye. carries. Uh, the next item is the, the French legation, the easement that we were coordinating with TechStock to make sure that we maintain service, uh, uh, an easement for service that we would connect to the neighborhood. And the recommendation is that we approve the easement moving forward. So that's the motion. I'll make the motion move to approve staff recommendation to grant a public utility easement at the French legation state historic site. <coughs> second. We have a second. Discussion? We'll vote all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. 
And then the final is with the uh, Longhorn herd, um, as we can begin to look at uh, potential opportunities, both um, private and public, um, to really kind of be, be um, creative, think outside the box. The recommendation is that uh, we would then move towards um, looking at all those options and then bring those back to the commission for <laughs> continued vetting. And then we've got. Rob? Yes, sir. Uh, rather than a, a broad approval to the staff, given the visibility of this, it might be appropriate for you, the chair and the vice chair, to ask for approval to oversee those negotiations okay. rather than an open-ended authorization that may come back not in the shape that we want. Do you want to go to the motion so it could be modified? Okay. Move to authorize the uh, uh, threesome or the executive committee, <laughs> yeah. an executive yeah. committee to enter at least negotiations for land for the Longhorn yeah. herd and explore partnership opportunities yeah. for stewardship of the herd. So, okay, John, let's let, let's formalize it to say the executive right. committee of the commission. Okay, right. we'll say move to authorize the executive committee of the commission. Of the commission of the two. Okay. So there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And those are the items. Any other matter? Has nope. anything happened since last night? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we've been, uh, we've been having thing. very good conversations with uh, Commissioner Perini, and we're going to tap into his knowledge base as we kind of move forward and keep the executive committee apprised at <laughs> all the opportunities. And we've also reached out to the GLO. Um, and we're beginning those conversations as well. Great, Thank great, you. great. Thanks. That completes our report. Well done. Commissioner Garcia. Yes, we had a um, brief but informative uh, committee meeting, uh, despite we didn't have a full quorum, but uh, Charles, you can give us a real quick brief overview. Oh, just real quickly, we, uh, we talked about uh, the historical marker, the application cycle is current currently open with CHC Outreach. We're working on annual reporting right now. We do have one new staff person. If you see Rihanna Heft around at the Real Places Conference, please say hi. I showed a couple of the uh, recent National, National Register listed uh, properties, and that was it for us. I have a question. Yes, sir. On the markers, the contract we have now, when does it expire? It expires, I believe, October 31st. So this year. That's correct. So we have been working with, um, uh, with procurement to work on RFP process to find a, a new um, a foundry or the same one if they reapply for that. Um, when do you think we would have a close price for the next 12 months? That, that's a really good question. We want to, uh, we definitely want to have a, a foundry in place before the end of the October 31st time, although we can continue going to next year where we have so many markers that, that are with them right now. But once, that, um, once the RFP process is complete, the contract is out there, then we'll, we'll know what the prices are going to be for the coming year at least. Do we always only have one supplier or do we go to two? We've historically just had one supplier that's been able to do all the casting that we need to do. Uh, would the staff consider getting to two contracts in order to speed this up? <laughs> we, we could do that. that. That might cause some communications issues, but if we can do things faster and if there are other uh, foundries that can do things better than another foundry can, that would make sense. I don't know if any commissioner has an opposing, uh, it would just seem to me that we hear about these delays. One supplier is a tight bottleneck. Mm -hmm. So let's explore and then hear back from what you 
Warren. All right, we'll do that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yes. So noted, and thank you. And thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going <laughs> to jump. I'm going to jump around a little bit, uh, Eric. If lawyers are up mouthpieces, here's our new mouthpiece. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, welcome aboard. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Thank you very much. I'm here to present a very brief update on legal matters. I have uh, deliberated with Assistant Attorney General Dennis McKinney, who unfortunately became ill today and could not be here, and he confirmed that we have no pending litigation matters, so that's always a good thing. Uh, and I, I, I believe that's all I have to report, but I am certainly here for any questions you have. In the future, we'll time you. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Does anyone have any questions? Well, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> now, um, the executive committee to the, are there any reports out of the executive committee? No? No? No. We're, we're on a groove. Um, now, we have uh, in the interim of not a single executive director, we have two uh, functioning, Joseph obviously as temporary for the sites and Brad for everything else. And we'll see how this flows while we do some degree of search, but it's, it's clear at least to your chairman that there are two absolutely distinct functions of what we do. The biggest, obviously, by budget is historic sites. It's what touches most people. Internally, we need to have a tight uh, function. I think you've heard from a number of commissioners that we've got to address the scoring and in that clearly are the wages. So it may be that we just keep it separated for a bit and see how, it, uh, how this goes. So I'm going to say, Joseph, on an ED for the site you reported, correct? Okay, Brad? In my 72 hours or whatever we're at, um, we do have new staff throughout the agency, including the historic sites. Uh, you can see the headquarters, primarily headquarters staff on the screen now that have joined us in the last, pretty much all in the last month or so, and some in a few days, and quite a few staff out at our historic sites. Um, so we're happy to be filling positions. Some of those, uh, I think, were new. Some of those are uh, replacements for staff that unfortunately departed. So, And then we really don't have an executive director's report, but I will say that uh, at the beginning of March, uh, Vaughn and I were able to go to D.C. and visit many of the key congressional offices. Uh, I participated in the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers annual meeting, which included a couple of hours with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation uh, and some time with the National Park Service staff that interact. Um, so we had a good opportunity there and then certainly good opportunity talking to primarily staff of the, in the various congressional offices. Joseph? Yes. I just have a few reports. Um, the site visits are going very well. Um, I have a few more to complete and to make sure that I complete the annual visits that I usually have scheduled. Um, we had a very good um, meeting with the National Museum of the Pacific War. We had uh, Japanese delegates who were there in regards to the transfer of a tank. Um, they had a Japanese tank that the museum in Japan wanted. 
Um, they had an operating tank that we could use in the combat zone. Um, so General Hagee had a signing ceremony. The tank that was at the National Museum of the Pacific War was actually owned by the United States government. We coordinated with the admiral in charge of that ownership of that tank and at the very last minute was transferred to General Hagee and he was very pleased before the signing, signing ceremony. Um, and we were able to um, zoom back into Tokyo. We had three um, parliament members who participated in the signing um, ceremony. Actually, one is actually signed, is lined up to be the next prime minister. So we were able to really kind of make some significant inroads with our connection with uh, the Japanese government in, uh, in Japan. Um, we did have the, French, the Irish um, consulate come and visit uh, the French legation. Um, he was very eager on kind of tying our, our sites with uh, the Irish heritage that we may have at our sites, so we were able to really kind of engage him, and we were very excited about that. And then I've been working with General Hagee in regards to the issue about the cyber attack that they had. Um, we've been working through and making sure that we have a differentiation in um, systems there. We want to make sure that their systems are updated. And then we also um, made sure that um, their staff that we had originally planned to engage and hire um, was separated, so they are going to move forward in hiring their own IT personnel, which would be directly responsible for their system, so we didn't have this crossover of responsibility. And that's everything. Any questions? Well, let's see. We've done legal matters. Uh, my report is to say thank you to everyone. I do hear the issue on compensation, and I'm gonna work with the executive committee and senior staff to get a good approach to the legislature, because we can't solve that problem on our own. So to you all and Joseph, please get that word out, all right? Do I have anything else? Being none, commissioners, any further business being none? I say the meeting is adjourned. It is 12.32, Wednesday, April 3rd. Thank Same you. day we started, okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.